I was going to start with the question of what a, I mean, also we had spoken before, and you said you also wanted to talk about sort of how, how the idea of a bourgeois revolution fit into the broader kind of Marxist philosophy of history, right? Sort of the view of like the totality of human history in the bourgeois. So I wanted to bring it begin by asking a sort of question about how you would define a bourgeois revolution and what its specificity is. So I happened to be reading some Portuguese history. And I found out that like, so there was a, a political crisis in Portugal in the late 14th century in 1383 to 1385 that brought a new dynasty to power, the Avis dynasty. And there are Portuguese historians who labeled that a bourgeois revolution, right? And I think that most of us in the room would like, I'm not expecting you to talk about Portuguese history, but would not like see that type of event necessarily as bourgeois revolution. And the argument is about like, well, apparently like most of the the bourgeoisie in Lisbon like helped finance the winning dynastic side. And then the period that followed is of course this period of Portuguese exploration and expansion in the world. So this is sort of seen as like promoting, right? But at the same time, you know, obviously you would think of like the classic British revolutions and so forth. So and the other question is, like, like if we accept this notion of a bourgeois revolution, part of the notion of a bourgeois revolution is that it's a product of modernity and issues in modernity. So the question is, why before whenever the Renaissance, the 17th century, whatever the, the marker of what you call the first bourgeois revolution, why were there no bourgeois revolutions in the ancient world? Why did bourgeois revolutions just begin? Like, like, how do you see that phenomenon? Like, the beginning of a bourgeois revolution, and what constitutes a bourgeois revolution? Just start from there. Okay. Well, that's an easy one to begin with. <laughs> well, I guess a, a very simple definition of bourgeois revolution would be, I would say, um, a political event, a political happening that essentially, right, furthers the development of civil society. Now, let me say a bit more what I mean by that. What I mean here by civil society is interchangeably with the term bourgeois society, right? Bourgeois, civil, same thing. And so, of course, with the development of civil society, there is the development of a bourgeois class, of an urban-based uh, mercantile manufacturing class. But I don't see bourgeois revolutions as most essentially... Uh, victory of a class, of a bourgeois class stratum, but rather a, uh, a, a political event that furthers the development of civil society and that subjects the, the political order to the reproduction of civil society. If I can say a little bit about where I see that coming from. Basically, um, the westernmost part of the Eurasian landmass was an extremely backward place. Uh, after the fall of the Western Roman Empire. If you think of the kind of great arc of civilization across Eurasia that stretches from about the Mediterranean Sea to the The whole Pacific concept Ocean. of the Dark Ages is a local phenomenon. Yes. Okay. So, but if you think of that great kind of arc of civilization from the Mediterranean to the Pacific Ocean, um, basically, you had great agricultural civilizations there, agrarian civilizations. The Roman Empire was the great agrarian civilization of the Mediterranean. Um, in effect, when Europeans talk about an old world, what they're referring to really is Southern Europe, North Africa, Levant, the greater kind of Roman Imperium. Um, when that falls apart, let's not get into dispute about Dark Ages or how bad things are. We don't need to debate characterizations, but basically the level of civilization collapses in the Western Roman Empire from about, let's say, 500 AD CE, whatever floats your boat. Um, essentially... You have a very low level of civilization in that arc of civilization across the Eurasian landmass. For various reasons that I think are all very contingent, by about the 12th century, you have the renewal, sometimes called the 12th century renaissance, a kind of medieval agrarian civilization develops. But what's very specific there is there also begins to emerge a city civilization, right? Meaning there begins to emerge a, a towns, a kind of a towns and cities dotted across the landscape that come from there having been a successful agricultural development. And there we begin to see what, what I would say, just the kind of 
proto-civil society, early seeds of a town life of people, whether they're merchants and bankers like the Medici, or they're simply textile workers in Flanders experiencing free interaction between people, right? So we're talking now by the late Middle Ages, this phenomenon that the Germans capture as Stadtluft macht frei. Town air makes men free, right? Which is this growing sense of a kind of world based on free labor, a free interaction. It still has patriarchy Which is different from guilds, other parts of Eurasia. Very different. Patriarchy, guilds, all sorts of things. And it's still encompassed within wider feudalism. That is dependent social relations in the countryside. But it's beginning to develop there. Okay, And essentially, for various reasons, and I don't want to go on forever, but let's just touch them all together. Um, the, the Renaissance, the, 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 the increasing interconnections between these towns and cities through mercantile manufacturing networks, the discovery of the New World with the Portuguese rounding of the southern tip of Africa into the Indian Ocean, into wider Asia, and then the Spanish, of course, you know, Spanish slash Genoese discovery of the New World, right, in quotes here, um, which opens up an immense field for mercantile, colonial, extractive, commercial endeavor of all sorts, and basically inaugurates a global division of labor and a world market which in turn allows these little seedlings of kind of the life of civil society in these towns and cities of late medieval Europe to continue to develop unimpeded, right? And what I think you then began to see is a much wider culture of literacy, of uh, the emergence of what we might call, you know, uh, as I said, a bourgeois class, right? Um, an elite that is not based in ownership of land and mastery over men, but much more in mobile wealth and capital, um, a wider reading public. And by during the 15th, 16th, 17th centuries, what you essentially see is not only is feudalism and its key institution serfdom dissolving throughout Western Europe, but also crucially, the church is losing its monopoly of scholarship and culture. Right, the Roman Catholic Church, the central institution of Latin Christendom, is basically losing its monopoly of intellectual and cultural life. And it's spilling out through the Renaissance and the Protestant Reformation and the Catholic Reformation following that after Trent. It's spilling out to this wider groups in towns and cities. And indeed, even that is penetrating the countryside. And you have a literacy and a reading public and a world that people can speak to that is you know, not constrained at all. And it's it's in that world where the scientific revolution can begin to germinate in the late 16th and 17th century. All sorts of things can develop. You know, this is the Republic of Letters, eventually the Enlightenment. But long story short, my view is you have the embryo of bourgeois society, of civil society, developing during the 15th, 16th, 17th century. And then when you beget to see is the real classic bourgeois revolutions, the Dutch Revolt, 1568, 1648, um, I can get more into that later. And then the English Revolution in the mid-17th century are uh, the first of a series of bourgeois revolutions, which are the political victory of civil society over the political order, right? Okay. If that makes sense. Right. So right. I want to I follow up. So yeah. there's a, there are two things you're talking about. One is this sort of trifecta of like Renaissance, Reformation, and Scientific Revolution, mm -hmm. right? Scientific Revolution being the third. Now... Again, there'd be a lot of historians who would see both the Renaissance and Reformation as still having what are sometimes called medieval elements, whereas maybe the scientific revolution would be different. But even then, people are like pushing it back. So there's this gray zone, right? And now you speak about the true bourgeois revolutions. So classic, classic. The classic. Yeah. But that implies that you see like a difference between like the Dutch Revolt and the British revolutions of the 17th century and say the kind of phenomenon you had in Renaissance Italy, that they were more radical, that they anticipate modernity in some deeper way. That's one question. And then, because I want to move it up to the late 18th century, which I wanted to talk about. Right. So, so I wanted you to get into what you see of the Dutch revolt and let's say the English revolutions of the 17th century that is sort of more radical and more modern than the earlier kind of, let's say more organic developments like the Renaissance, the Reformation, etc., which also had political manifestations? It's a good question. I mean, not to get bogged down in details, but basically um, with the dissolving of feudal social relations, you essentially have um, the increasing concentration of power in a political center, 
in the Middle Ages, power had been fragmented out to different uh, feudal nobility across regions and localities. But the creation the, of a modern state. Yes, exactly. The but, emergence but part of, of that goes along with absolutism. That's exactly right. The emergence of a centralized state, which in its first flush is royal absolutism, right? Royal absolutism is both the, the last great age of monarchy and the first age of the modern state, right? Because you have a center of political power. The regional and local elites and nobility have lost their ability to coerce people. That has been centralized in a king, a monarchy, a court, and Which, that's absolutely Who are generally getting support from the bourgeoisie. Absolutely. Getting support from the bourgeoisie. So why the Dutch Revolt? Why the English Revolution? For contingent reasons, these processes of building absolute monarchies, while successful in Spain, while successful in France, while successful in Sweden, while successful in Denmark, But not fail, in Germany and Italy. Yes. Fail um, in and, and unsuccessful elsewhere. In the case of the Dutch Revolt, and even much more so the English Revolution, the failure to consolidate a successful absolutism is not because of a simple failure, but an actual political rupture. Basically, when the Habsburg, the, when, the, when the Spanish House of Habsburg, the Spanish branch of the House of Habsburg, tries to impose Spanish-style absolutism on the Low Countries, the, the provinces in, in what is today Benelux, Belgium, Netherlands, Luxembourg, there's a revolt, and for various reasons it breaks through. And you have the successful political defeat of Sp the assertion of Spanish absolutism. In the English revolution of the mid-17th century, when the Stuarts try and assert an English absolutism, again, there's a revolt and you have a successful breakthrough. One could get into details of the Dutch revolt, the English revolution, but what makes them so important is in this break, in this political chasm, essentially the people who move, the traditional elites, because the initial fight, if I can be, sorry I'm going on like this, but the Dutch Revolt and English Revolution, it's initially an intra-elite fight between traditional elites, right? It's the absolute monarch, the court that's trying to centralize power against the traditional elites. Some segment of the traditional elites tries to rebel against it, but in their successful rebellion, they have to call forth forces that have not been politicized before. They generally, if I had to put it to you, they have to politicize civil society. We see this in Amsterdam, we see this in Rotterdam, above all else, we see this in London, where sections of the Dutch and English elite to defeat their various absolutisms have to call on this developing civil society, these middling social strata of merchants and bankers and petty manufacturers and lower below artisans, craftsmen, tradesmen, and they come into politics, right? And there's a deep and profound politicization and in a weird way, although all they were attempting to do was actually to defend the old status quo, to prevent absolutism, they actually unleash new forces. And by the end of those revolutions, what's happened is the political orders that are constituted are actually now subject to civil society. That doesn't mean we have democratic regimes. It means we have kind of proto-liberal regimes. Okay. Yeah. So, so, I mean, again, it, it seems to me like there might be like, a question. I mean, you could go back and ask, but well, why didn't like the other class struggles, plebeian struggles that existed in late medieval Renaissance society, even ancient society, why didn't they usher in something similar? That's one question going back. But I also wanted to look forward to what's often called the age of democratic revolution, like the Ara Palmer, the, the last, let's say, 40 years from the end of the Seven Years' War to around 1800. And the, that period is in turn different because that's the birth of a modern left. It's the birth of the category of the left, not merely of a bourgeois revolution. So the, for all the radicalism of the classic bourgeois revolutions, they didn't really usher in a modern left. And so I want to talk, like, because we, I would like to also go back to the question about, like, ancient and late medieval society and why if there was class struggle, if there were plebeian interventions in politics, which I think there were, why they didn't usher in something like a bourgeois revolution. The, but I want to look forward and say, like, when we look at this period, again, of the late 18th century, there are the two poles. There were, like, many small revolutions, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the patriots and so forth. It was a time of political upheaval. But the two big poles are the American and French Revolution. And often in the kind of historiography and popular memory, these two revolutions have been counterposed, right? And they sort of influence how one looks at the question of a bourgeois revolution. 
So one tradition, which is the dominant Marxist tradition, sees the French Revolution as the good revolution, the radical revolution, the profound revolution. Mm -hmm. I would say that's the dominant Marxist tradition. I mean, there's also another tradition which, on the contrast, is seen the French Revolution as the bad revolution and the American Revolution as the good revolution, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's a third tradition which sees them as part of the same revolutionary process, right? And I'm just see how you would sort of, which of those sort of views in terms of like the radicalism, the the problem of Jacobinism, like like how you, you see that in terms of like the 21st century? Um, Definitely the third tradition. That is that there's a general revolutionary process, right? Um, the reason why I think that there's... I, I think there's in generally one bourgeois revolution, but I'll get into that in a moment. But the kind of classic bourgeois revolutions, the Dutch Revolt, the English Revolution now, the American Revolution, and the French Revolution, 1789, they're different from prior revolts because they're deeply informed by that new consciousness that's emerged, right? That bourgeois subjectivity that I talked about earlier. Right with all those developments in the 15th and 16th and 17th century, they were going on, but with those political breaks in the Netherlands and then in England, but even more so in the British Empire in the late 18th century and in France at the very end of the 18th century, that new consciousness comes in to state power and is driving political affairs in a way it simply hadn't been before. And and in the American and French case, it's it's much more radical than the Dutch and the English who still, the Dutch and English revolutionaries still understand themselves as restoring broadly an old order, right? They still understand themselves as doing that. Whereas you get now a sense, you know, with the American and French revolutions of a, of a new age beginning, right? As Paine puts it, a new dawn of man with the American revolution, so right? So there's, there's a line of de Tocqueville. He says that yeah. the, the French revolution was one before it even began. And what he means by that is it was the ideas of the Enlightenment and of some kind of notions of human equality and the arbitrariness had sort of permeated society by the late 18th century. And the French Revolution kind of just ratified it, right? So, I mean, would you be sympathetic to that? And and then that raises the question of like, like to the extent that that notion is true, to what extent does the actual political trajectories of these revolutions matter? Um. The political, to answer the last part first, the political trajectories matter because they, they build on one another. That is to say, because of the Dutch Revolt, the English Revolution is possible. That is, it's very difficult mm. to see a possible success in the English Revolution absent the kind of space the Dutch Republic, as this great commercial maritime republic, created by essentially not only defeating Spanish absolutism, but basically being the sole power in the 17th century to, pretend, to prevent Louis XIV's France from creating a European hegemony. I mean, if there was no Dutch Republic, or if it had been successful, French absolutism by the 17th century would have had the Stuart monarchy in England as a satellite power, essentially. And so only with the Dutch Revolt and its successful opening of a geopolitical space would you have had the possibility of the English Revolution, and only with the English Revolution, did you have by the 18th century in the British Atlantic world a kind of civil society developing in the North Atlantic, the Western world, that made possible the later American and French revolutions, right? So th that would be broadly my view about the trajectory, that, that one shouldn't think of them as within a contained national space. The Dutch revolt transforms the multi-state system of Europe, and the, the, the English revolution is deeply influenced by it, and in turn, the English revolution brings a bourgeois power into the sphere of great powers of Europe and basically by the 18th century it becomes the greatest power, right? Okay, I, I'm sympathetic to that, but but again, like I, I, it sounds to me like really what you're putting forward is a kind of basically an Atlantic revolution thesis vis-a-vis. -vis uh -huh. Yeah, I said thing. general revolution yeah. process. And, yeah. and, the, that, and I'm sympathetic to that perspective. I mean, the problem is that revolutions also exists in terms of a historical memory. And the historical memory of the French and American revolutions is very different, right? And the, and the way they are debated, and the, particularly in terms of the left, is very different. So the problem for the American revolution is in some ways that it seems the purely successful bourgeois revolution that leads to American global hegemony and is therefore seen as conservative. The problem with the French Revolution is that 
the problem of Jacobinism, which is seen as perhaps like the anticipation of Bolshevism. And so the question of the relationship between the French Revolution and the Bolshevik Revolution and the whole thesis of basically left-wing totalitarianism, right? So that is the historiograph problem of historiographical memory, right? And I mean, in that sense, it's striking how particularly vis-a-vis -vis the French Revolution over the last generation, as you well know, there's almost come to be a narrative that the French Revolution either didn't really occur or didn't need to occur. It seems like like, like there has been a, a, a profound turn against the narrative of bourgeois revolution that you outlined. And that's clearly connected to current and the, the political events of the last, you know, 50 years. And I'm wondering how you as a historian see that process. I think that's largely an artifact of the Cold War. Um, I think but that... it seems to me that in some respects, the turn against it is even more a product of the end of the Cold War. Like you could, that was the narrative of the Cold War that you had the Atlantic Revolution on one, the liberal side and the kind of Franco-centric, Stalinist scholarship, right? The Lefebvre, but Lefebvre versus Palmer or Cobb. But like post, like I'm thinking of the last 30 years or, let or me, since. Let me, let me address this age. anecdotally because it's a big question. I really do think it's an artifact of the Cold War. You can go to Mount Vernon, George Washington's estate, and in the main house there hangs the key of the Bastille. We're about to or celebrate Bastille Day, July 14th. There hangs the key. It was given to him by his protege and extremely close friend, the Marquis de Lafayette, right? Who came over as a young aristocrat, uh, an Enlightenment radical, right? Who came over and participated in the American Revolution. Let me just take this anecdotally. It's going to take me a while, but let me, it'll get there, right? Basically, young aristocrat has all the privileges of the old regime, um, family very close to the Bourbon monarchy in France, Louis XV, Louis XVI, um, Experience, you know, it becomes a member of the reading public, right? This world of pamphlets and coffee houses and salons and debates where people basically come in and not through their birthright or their bloodline or their sword win debates through persuading other people, right? Through persuasion, right? Through the exercise of reason is a participant in this world, inhabits the Enlightenment, is reading texts from all over the Dutch, the Scottish, the, 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 the Neapolitan, all of that. Right. And becomes radicalized and essentially, you know, is this kind of enlightenment radical. And eventually he comes to see the Atlantic imperial crisis. This is when you get the rise of the colonial resistance movement in British America against the British Empire, which eventually leads to the American Revolution, sees this Atlantic crisis and the outbreak of political revolution against the British Empire in 1775 as essentially a kind of um, breakthrough in a more natural landscape, that is the western, the other end of the Atlantic Ocean, right, of, of this kind of, these Enlightenment ideals, right, of, uh, of a republic, right, of liberty and equality, etc., right, uh, natural law, what have you, travels against initially, because the French don't until 1778 sign a treaty with the Americans. Um, it should be said, there's no successful American Revolution without the French alliance, right? But that being said, um, they don't sign a treaty until 1778. They're very, they're very worried about this revolution. Louis XVI is nervous about supporting rebellion against, as much as the French and British monarchy dislike one another, they're brother monarchs, right? They don't want to support the rebellion of some colonists, some subject population against the rightful crown, the rightful sovereign. And so they're skeptical against, you know, the people who don't want him to go over. He goes over, very closely befriends, um, George Washington becomes a protege of him. George Washington is the older of the two. It's kind of weird father-son relationship developed. Not weird in that sense, but I mean in another sense. But that all being said, essentially, uh, you know, very, very close. And ultimately, they're successful, right? Um, they're there when Cornwallis is cornered at Yorktown in 1781 and surrenders. And uh, the British Empire gives up the ghost. And you have American independence recognized by 1783. Subsequently, Lafayette's very involved in the outbreak of the French Revolution, as you well know. The Marquis de Lafayette is very important in the National Guard, very important in maintaining Paris during the revolutionary process that begins in the summer of 1789. Um, eventually, he gets the key to the Bastille after the 
the the Parisian um, uh, uh, basically a mob terrorist. You know, be, it's believed that there's an arms depot. You know, they're tearing down arms depots to prevent because there's basically become information that Louis the Sixteenth is moving in troops towards Paris and Versailles to snub out the National Assembly process that's going to take place out in Versailles with the Tennis Court Oath. And basically, people are tearing down arms depots, and the Bastille is seen as this great bastion of royal absolutism, of despotism, because even though there aren't many prisoners there, they're basically there by the king's fiat, meaning that Louis XVI can just declare through the exercise of his prerogative that you're a political enemy of the regime and you can be put there, right? So they tear down the Bastille. Eventually, Lafayette gets the key. He gives it to Washington, mm-hmm. hangs him out for an into this day. Repeatedly, uh, uh, there's a very close relation to them. Lafayette goes back. He then famously comes back to the United States in 1824, for a tour of basically kind of early Jacksonian America, right? Um, very, he writes very critical stuff about slavery because he's beginning to see that he he knows that the found who we call the founders were all anti-slavery and thought that they'd essentially set slavery up on the course of extinction. But he can already see in the 1820s this isn't happening, mm. right? That things have been reversed and that slavery is becoming essential, right? In a new way, particularly with the whole cotton mills of of the British Empire demanding that raw cotton. And um, the reason why I say all of this is to just talk about French-American linkages. It was totally normal year in, year out throughout U.S. history to celebrate um, uh, this relationship. In fact, FDR gives a very famous speech, I don't remember the year, right, in in the 1930s, um, uh, giving, uh, before the Houses of Congress, giving Lafayette honorary citizenship. This was totally normal. And in that speech, FDR completely sees the American-French revolutions as interconnected. Right now, you might say, well, he's he's he knows that there's going to be a war eventually. And he's reinforcing a Western alliance against the Nazis, what have you. But it's totally natural to him. I think it's only the subsequent process of the Cold War, right, that sets up this narrative of oh, the French Revolution is a social revolution that has these bad consequences of Jacobinism. Up until a hundred years ago, where the American France Revolution the remains United purely States political. Only, okay, so that brings yeah. it up until a hundred years ago, really. Uh, France and the United States remain the only important republics in the world. Yeah. I mean, there were, yeah. and and so there again, there are two concepts which dominate this moment. Yeah, one is um, republicanism, mm-hmm. and the other is democracy. Mm-hmm. Right, and I mean, it's interesting that before the American and French Revolution in the 18th century, republics that existed, like Venice or the Dutch Republic were highly oligarchical. Like in some respects, they were even more oligarchical yeah. than the monarchies and more restrictive. And so it would seem that there's a moment where this notion of the unification of republicanism and democracy is in some respects a new phenomenon, right? That previously you'd had republics, but the idea of a republic was not necessarily democratic. And democracy at least on the left fringes, seems to at this moment become a kind of plausible political project, whereas previously it had been regarded with suspicion, right? I mean, as like a a dangerous idea. Would you say that's accurate? Yes, but I, again, I want to. I'm sorry to go back to this, but that that's why I'm saying the bourgeois revolution is the victory of civil society. It's not necessarily democracy. What I mean by that is the the idea. Let me. But surely for the left, the idea of democracy was central, right? In other words, like like both the the idea of, yes, you have civil society, but it's the idea of democracy and its extension to a social realm that creates a modern left, isn't it? Like if you didn't have a notion of democracy. No, I would say the democracy exists in the social realm before it exists in the political realm. Can I try and just explain what I mean? Okay. So we do the reading in Platypus. Um, we still do this reading, right? The Constant. Um, do we still do yes. that for the yeah. beginning yes. of the reading group? Yes. Um, the liberty of the ancients compared with the moderns, yes. right? And Constant is a famous French Restoration liberal, right? And he gives that speech in like 1818 or 19. On he's, the distingu- he's distinguishing between ancient democratic re- republics of ancient Greece. Yeah. Right. But when you look at sort of more modern post-Renaissance Europe, or you look at, or be more accurate, you look at Europe of the 18th century, right? Yeah. Like in the earlier part of the 18th century, if any, republics were not democratic institutions and democracy until 
the end of the century is not a, it becomes a, a kind of common concept yes. that people defend right at the end of the century after right after both of these revolutions particularly the or the whole series of introduce a kind of notion of democracy into the world yeah. that sort of the earlier bourgeois revolutions might have at the fringes but not as deeply right in other words th that you were able to have like a the the Babeuf and the conspiracy of equals, right? Yeah. Implicit in that is still some notion of democracy that then is like transferred. In other words, the the, the Jacob, I, I it, it does seem to me there is a moment there at the end of the 18th century and connected with these revolutions that in that introduces both of these notions in a different sense. In other words, the notion of the democratic republic as an ideal political form for the mm -hmm. left mm -hmm. seems to be a notion that comes about in the late 18th century at this moment. Let me say something. It's not disagreement, but it is a difference. I mean, we can get hang, hung up on this term democratic republic, right? Let me just say, can I go back to the Constant references? Anybody mind if I do that for a minute? So, so Constant gives the speech under the restored Bourbon monarchy, right? And we read that in, in, in Platypus Reading Group. And as Richard says, it's this comparis, comparing what is modern liberty versus ancient. Somewhere in the beginning of that speech, I don't remember exactly how it's put. So I'll get the spirit, but not the letter of it. Constant starts the speech. He's giving us a public lecture. And he starts the speech basically saying, we who live in modern liberty. And then he says, as an aside, in England, America, and France. Right? And, and he's very explicit, basically saying the post-revolutionary Western world. Right. That, that is that that segment of the North Atlantic or the Western world that has basically experienced what I'm calling bourgeois revolution here. The political conquest of civil society over the state. Let me just finish this, I promise, because I'll get back to your point. The political conquest of civil society over the state. Now, if we were to look at the world, um, we've got uh, uh, in England, we are not even close to the 1832 Reform Act, which doesn't even, does not in any way to lead to mass democracy. It simply gives the upper section of the middle, cl middle class males the vote. America, not only do you still have mass enslavement and women totally excluded, but serious uh, limitations that won't be removed until the age of Jacksonian democracy on um, uh, 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 male plebeian participation, plebeian of European de descent participation. Uh, we go to France, we've got a restored Bourbon monarchy, which is essentially a police state, right? Mm -hmm. In no way a republic. But he can sit there and say, we who live in modern liberty. What does he mean? Well, he turns to civil society. What I mean by the kind of the social realm of democracy, right? And, and what he clearly lays out there is what has happened is that people are in this world are increasingly becoming self-possessed, self-determining individuals where they can set the course of their own life. As Jefferson puts it, they can pursue their own happiness, right? And, and let me just say what's meant by that. Meaning, let's, let's just take England as the example, or Great Britain. We're sitting in Great Britain in 1750. It's in no way democratic. It's going to take the first steps towards what we call democracy in 1832 and only achieve it in our terms in 1928. In 1750, how would somebody with Constance understanding understand Britain to have modern liberty? What he means That's is this. 50. 1750, Constant's not alive, but he's clearly referring back to England having oh, been oh, okay. this site of modern liberty. Mm -hmm. What he means by that is, no, let's just think of 1750 uh, Great Britain. You've got a, a parliament and king. The king's obviously a hereditary monarch, this German line, the Hanover is rule, and they're subject to parliament, but parliament is in its upper house just inherited aristocrats who pass on their peerages as seats, the House of Lords. And in the lower house, it's basically just the lesser nobility, the gentry, and wealthy farmers electing amongst themselves MPs to go and sit in the House of Commons. It's in no way Democratic, Republican, anything like that. But the idea here is this, essentially, that, that, that basically with the success of the English revolutions and the development uh, 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 and the subjection of the state to civil society, you essentially have people who are increasingly free laborers, self-possessed, self-determining, trying to pursue uh, employment where they want to, trying to pursue entrepreneurship enterprise where they want to, 
For the 18th century, high degrees of social mobility, meaning compared to other areas, not just in West, not just in the world, but in Western Europe, can move and live other places. They can fail at life. I mean, one can go read Daniel Defoe's Mall Flanders, is the great, you know, novel of this. Henry Fielding, others. You can fail at this in life. You can kind of be a rake here and recover yourself there. That's the freedom of civil society, right? A self-possessed, self-determining individual with all of the prejudices and coercions that still exist in the 18th century England. That's what's understood. And basically the view of people is it doesn't matter that there's a hereditary German king on the throne and parliament is run by aristocrats and gentlemen lords that I have no say in because what do I care as long as they provide the public infrastructure, the law and order, the courts, the external defense, uh, the roads, but, the canals, the turnpikes, the harbors, the navy, the maritime routes, necessary for me to be able to develop as an individual. But right? by the let, 1790s, it does matter. Let, it's going to, but let me just say, that's the concept of modern liberty, and that's, that's really crucial, because the point is this, is and again, this is not, one should not, neoliberalism has ruined liberalism, because neoliberalism has this ridiculous idea of liberalism means a weak state, which it doesn't. Right. It's not that these people think that there's a weak state. It's that they think that the state is not devoted to the personal caprice of the political elite. That is, even if the state is dominated by hereditary nobles and monarchs. Right. As long as it's not devoted to their personal caprice, as long as it's forced, required to uphold the civil rights, religious liberties, um, of people provide the public infrastructure, the public realm for the free play of private interests. Right. Law and order, courts, external defense, canals, turnpikes, all of that. It will allow for the self-development of civil society, the people to individually and collectively congregate, associate, debate, publish, uh, 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 set up political parties, set up voluntary associations, that it will allow for development of an entire voluntary associational world where people will create their own collectivities, their own reading societies, their own schools, their own businesses, their own churches, their own enterprises, and set up their own rules for governing their own membership. And what does it matter if I'm a merchant in Bristol or I'm a farmer in you know, lowland Scotland, as long as I can pursue what I want to, what does it, and parliament is providing what I need, what does it matter if I can vote for these people or not, right? So we have to ask the question, of why there does become, because you're right, by the late 18th century, there begins to be a critique of the fact of a kind of unrepresentative institutions. That, after all, is the great battle cry of the late 18th century. It's not just America. It's across the Western world. No taxation without representation. And that basically means the view that, this, that these regimes, um, that the elites governing these regimes, um, that's a criticism of the ways they act that are in their own interest and not in the interest of civil society as a whole. I think we're anachronistic to think what they're demanding in the late 18th century in the era of the American French revolutions is basically 20th century mass universal suffrage, okay. right? What they're demanding is that the state eliminate all the ways it serves the caprice and arbitrary character of elites that control it and, in, and, and remove hereditary status and demanding instead a state that serves the whole reproduction of civil society. And that may need, let me just finish off this year, that may very well need that you have to enfranchise more people. It might be like lots of people begin to say in Britain and in France and in Brit colonial North and British colonial North America. And even there's the Dutch Patriot Revolt of 1787 where people say this. There's a revolt in the Swiss cantons in the 1760s when people say this. There are all these little revolts, some of which fail, the two most successful of which are America 76, France 89. But all these little and great revolts and revolutions, all basically, they do want to enfranchise more groups, right? Adult males of a humbler background, usually. But they want to do it because that's what they think is necessary to get a state that will be subject to the society and will operate in the interests of all of civil society. It's not this kind of qual quantitative conception of democracy that life is more democratic the more people vote. It's rather a qualitative conception of democracy, which is how much control do you have to set the course of your own life individually and collectively, right? Okay. And these people who want to enfranchise a bit more people, who want to abolish slavery, who begin to talk about women's emancipation, that's their concern. The, I think the vote is a huge distraction. Okay. I really believe from okay. that okay. wider thing. Okay, yeah. but but okay, two two issues I want to bring up. One is it seems to me, and it seems paradoxical, mm -hmm. that if you go back to the 1790s, the country, the constitution in the world, 
the entire planet that would have seemed most like our 21st century notion of democracy would be the Jacobin constitution in France, which isn't actually in play because of counter-revolutionary violence. So, but it's the most democratic, at least on paper, even though really what you have is a kind of revolutionary dictatorship. So in that sense, I think you are struck with the fact that the modern notion of democracy really goes back to Jacobinism. I think that there is a Jacobin lineage to democracy, which is denied. That's one thing, as well as to socialism, um, which is somewhat different from the narrative of bourgeois civil society. It's a specific version of that. Um, the other thing that I'm struck by is you talk about no taxation without representation and you're thinking of the American Revolution. And I was thinking, well, what about like the history, the prehistory in the, you know, the 1760s and 70s with the French Parliament and the resistance to the monarchy, right? It's an absolute monarchy, but it's resisted by all of these local, these institutions that represent privilege but are also in some sense backed by a wide swath of public opinion. So it's this, and, and that in turn raises another question, which is one of the things that's sort of hardest for us to understand about the bourgeois revolution is we live in a society without aristocracy or nobility, mm -hmm. right? And yet the bourgeois revolutions only make sense in terms of the contrast to this aristocratic society, right? And I, I wonder what that says then about like the genealogy of democracy, because I think there is a narrative that one encounters that, well, in the end, aristocracy was doomed. And therefore, like the, the bourgeois revolutions as political events were unnecessary. So I, here I push back on you is that democracy gets it's a sl democracy. Do you agree with my point about the Jacobins? Well, that, let me. OK, so let me take the Jacobins. Here's my view very quickly. The emphatic age of democracy in the Western world is the 1820s, to 1840s. That's when you're getting Jacksonianism right in the United States. That's when you're getting, um, you know, French democracy. That's when you're getting the Chartists. Right. This is when people really talk at the very least about universal adult male suffrage. Right. In an emphatic kind of way. Right. And you get democracy as this kind of bandied about term. The thing that I want to say, though, that's really important is that is already registering in some way capitalism. Right. That is bourgeois society is entering into a profound crisis with the constitution of industrial capital. Right. So all the kind of the, the great age of like democracy as a as a as a kind of just a term everywhere in places like France, Britain, United States is 1820s, 1840s, and that is beginning to register a kind of crisis of bourgeois society with the onset of industrial capitalism. Okay. Now the problem is Jacobinism, right? Cause you're, cause what you're basically saying to me, Richard, which is right, is Jacobinism comes a problem in this sense, because people then subsequently will see after that great age of democracy, Jacobinism is the first clear germs of it, right? Here's the problem I have with that narrative. And I'm not pretending to offer some completely coherent counter narrative, but let me just say what I think is going on. If you look at Thomas Paine's Rights of Man, which is the most famous um, work of the age of revolution in the Western world, if you think of the age, as Richard called it, the age of the Atlantic Revolution, this whole phenomenon of the North Atlantic world um, in between, say, the 1760s and let's say fall of Napoleon and Waterloo, right? Rights of Man is the most successful book. It's but something, how many, 200,000, some copies are sold throughout the Western world. Hugely successful by late 18th century standards. Thomas Paine, Paine in there says basically... The Naomi Klein of with, the 18th with, century. <laughs> no, that's unfair to Paine. <laughs> that was a joke. Uh, 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 so he has this vision of the withering away of the state. He sees government as corrupt and wicked and, you know, basically came into existence because, as he puts it, men aren't angels, right? So you need government, right? But otherwise, it should be as little as possible. But he also, when he gets programmatic in the rights of man, basically talks about all these things like old age pensions and protection for veterans and the disabled and education for the young and uh, 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 work homes and what we would call welfare for the poor, even a version of what we would call unemployment insurance, all these things are put forward. In fact, um, later 19th century and 20th century 
uh, uh, left-wing intellectuals will talk about the rights of man as basically what he lays out in there is a kind of proto-welfare state. That view then gets set up, right, where basically what is Paynite radicalism doing and calling for this kind of proto-welfare state and democracy? What are the Jacobins doing? Because the Jacobins don't just seek a democratic republic. They all People will point to Jacobin proposals, to Robespierre's curbing of prices, to Robespierre's redistribution um, during the bread shortages, to war, Robespierre's ro wartime measures, the, you know, the so-called era of the reign of terror, 70, 1793 and 94. We'll see this as a kind of proto-welfare state, right? And then they create these entire histories of, oh, well, we see the demand for democracy in the welfare state from the 1790s era up through, you know, the 20th century with its great achievement. Usually these things are told as this, and then some end of the story is Reagan and Thatcher is the great counter-revolution. The problem with that narrative is how can you have Payne, neither Payne nor Robespierre want anything like what we would call a welfare state. Well, what, wait, let me just, what they want is the self-governing democracy of civil society. But, but, the point is they advocate these measures as necessities to achieve that. Payne's view of giving out what we call essentially this public support to people is that will give them the ability to become self-possessed, self-determining individuals, able to set their own course of life in civil society. And over time, as you take care of such people and they become self-determining and self-possessed, you will have the winnowing away of that kind of public support and the full withering away of the state, right? The full withering away of the mm. political order to really become something like um, essentially simply the public infrastructure for the free play of private interests, right? Um, that's the aim. Even a Robespierre in calling for democracy is not calling for, you have to realize democracy in our terms is really about democratic state. That's really what it's about. Rosebeard does not want a democratic state. He wants political coercion to be removed from social life as much as possible, right? But obviously he, he and so... Although in practice, he's using an awful lot of it. What, that's 100% <laughs> right. But think about the context. I want to say the context. Of course. One, you've got the Vendée. Western France is essentially not under the control of the revolution anymore. Two, you've got the powers of Europe, um, Austria, Prussia, Russia, many others circling France, supported by the wealthiest country the world history has ever seen at that point, Britain, being subvented. Um, and A war not started by the started by the Girondins. And you have constant counter-revolutionary subterfuge and plots in Paris and elsewhere. This The reign of terror are wartime measures designed to basically preserve the revolution. But the idea in this so-called Jacobin Democratic Republic is not what democracy becomes in the 19th to 20th century, which is essentially a democratized Bonapartist state where you have political elites that rule over you and rule for you, but you get to have plebiscites for them every couple of years. What they're talking about with democracy is that you will determine yourself. And insofar as coercive power is to be exercised or you have to be given public support, it's just a temporary measure until you become a self-possessed and self-determining individual. So I would insist, and I admit there's lots of issues and details that one would have to go into, but I would insist that Robespierre not be reinterpreted in light of the crisis of capitalism in the 19th century and the kind of age of Jacksonian and Chartist and all of that democratization, but rather be seen as essentially pursuing radical coercive state power measures designed ultimately to save the revolution and to constitute a republic based on liberty, equality, and fraternity, where the state will be really minimal, where coercion in every aspect of life, in war with other countries and interactions with your fellow men and women will be reduced. Okay, so yeah. I, I want to talk again about like historical memory, and I want to talk about, so one of the things that's always struck me about the difference between like the Bolshevik Revolution and the French Revolution, the Bolshevik Revolution, when people are partisan over the partisans, you generally fall into like, Stalin or Trotsky, right? It's like the people who are like, everything went well, and the people who are the revolution betrayed. It's usually from a Trotskyist perspective, or people think the Bolsheviks were bad from the beginning, and Lenin was the problem. The left narrative on the, the French Revolution is much more confused and ambivalent, right? Both because of the way the Jacobins are seen. So there are differences about Robespierre, about who should be seen as like a hero, so they're not so much now. 
thinking about people who sort of saw Danton against Robespierre. Mm -hmm. But what I find most interesting in the 20th century in terms of an internal split on the left is the dominant tradition, sort of Marxist tradition, is pro robespierre right? There's this sort of sense of like Robespierre did what was necessary. And again, the analogy between the Jacobites and the Bolsheviks, whether positive or negative, like anti-Bolshevik, anti-Jacobinism, people like Talmon, or the main Bolshevik tradition, which is, yes, the Jacobins were predecessors. But there's also a, a far left tradition which actually is critical of Robespierre and takes this notion of a bourgeois revolution to see Robespierre and Babeuf the Jacobins. Against Robespierre. Well, yeah. Babeuf against Robespierre, although Babeuf himself is somewhat ambivalent, depending upon when he's talking, yeah. but which sees, like I'm thinking Daniel Guerin, sees Robespierre and the Jacobins as repressing the revolutionary impulses of the masses. So I'm sort of ha curious how you come down which is a different view of the bourgeois revolution. In other words, it's not that Robespierre was some sort of proto-socialist, but it's sort of Robespierre was maintaining bourgeois law and order, which he clearly was. And in that sense that the actual masses were more revolutionary and the Jacobins were holding back the masses. I'm sort of curious how you see that narrative. And I, I guess like the other historic, but we'll, answer that and then I was going to ask you another historiographical narrative about the American Revolution, which is the curious subsequent histories of Hamilton and Jefferson. Um, very, <clears throat> very quickly on the democracy front. Um, the Jacobins. The Jacobins. And Robespierre particularly and sort of vis-a-vis -vis the sans -coulot and Right. So <clears throat> what, what I'm trying to get at here is that uh, but that's not really democracy, about democracy becomes bowdlerized. Okay. In the bourgeois revolutionary West, here I'm talking, let's say, the 17th, 18th century. Democracy is still, for the most part, a bad term. But why? There's a but the Jacobins were also yeah. defending bourgeois private property. And so you could say, well, yeah. and part of their concern vis-a-vis -vis the saint culotte you could say, was are they, were they restraining some sort of more radical revolution? But, but Robespierre says explicitly... Um, it's the opposite criticism of Robespierre Constant. explicitly says in one of his speeches... His assaults on private property are precisely for the greater preservation of private property, right? right. He points out the reason why he fully supported the elimination against slavery is because, uh, it, you know, he's saying, listen, if you have this absolute private property take, then you would have to defend slavery. But he's saying clearly there are forms of private property. There are actual violations of what he calls greater private property. He doesn't say private property is wrong because slavery would be private property. He says greater private property is that there shouldn't be slavery. So in a weird way, you abolish what people had conventionally understood up to the point is private property to serve the greater interest of real private property, which is these people should have own, the enslaved should have ownership of themselves and be able to create known things and exchange them with other people. OK, but I really just want to get this one point out. And I know I'm beating this to death, but I think it's worth it. And I hope people will tell me if I'm being repetitive or if I'm not going to sit enough. But but we have this really bowdlerized conception of democracy in the bourgeois revolutionary West. Democracy was still a bad term. There's no question about it. But there's a rational kernel why it was a bad term. And, and this is the rational kernel of 19th century conservative liberalism, which is that the tyranny of the majority is bad as the tyranny of a king. If you have a democracy of civil society, if you have social democracy, where self-possessed and self-determining individuals based on free labor and free exchange can set the course of their own lives, right? Then, um, let me just finish, Richard. Then you don't need... Right. Uh, uh, um, then, then the key here is uh, you want to prevent inroads against your own self-determination, your own um, setting the course of your own life, not only from kings and aristocrats, but also from the mob. Right. You don't. There's a rational kernel to the fear of mobocracy. It's absolutely. In other words, we should have no. I think the left, you know, classical Marxism would have no problem realizing that the dislike of democracy by the kind of classical bourgeois revolutionaries, by figures like Lafayette and Washington, was not somehow some kind of oligarchic or conservative or counter-revolutionary impulse. There was a belief that a majority of people could just as easily undermine liberty as a king or an aristocrat could. Right, the tyranny of the majority. The kind of this is the rational kernel yeah, of nineteen. Yeah, this yeah. this is preserved in 
19th okay. century conservative you want to ask a question? liberalism. Uh, I don't know if we should start the discussion. Yeah, sure. We will start this. Can I just finish this one yeah. last point? That, we've done? that That is preserved in 19th century conservative liberalism. The tyranny of the majority can be as bad as the tyranny of any king based on divine right or bloodline or what have you. Now, just to finish the point, the, 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 um, the Babeuf or the Constant. The Jacobins criticism. do not want a democratized state. The Jacobins want the ability of all people to participate in this free exchange, free labor of social life. Okay, they ultimately themselves too want the withering away of the state as a coercive form, being able to be controlled by anybody. Right, and I think that's really important to preserve and remember. What ends up happening in the nineteenth century, because of the crisis of bourgeois society, because of the onset of industrial capitalism, basically the contradiction of bourgeois society with itself, you basically get right the return of the state, the recrudescent of the state. You know, Bonapartism and classical Marxism, which you talk about in Platypus all the time. And what the actual story of modern democracy is is not the achievement of qualitative democracy advocated in the classic bourgeois revolutions, but rather the achievement of quantitative democracy, which is merely democratized Bonapartism, mm -hmm. right? Um, plebiscites every few years in which the, to determine which name runs the authoritarian state and throws which crumbs at you, okay? And that is just expanded ever more and more, you know, in the world to this day, right? So I, I really would say that, that, that we need to preserve that 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 if in, if you want to defend this term democracy, I think the way you def, the way you talk about it is qualitative control over collective and individual life, right? And that need not that that should not be reduced to the vote to the suffrage. And I think the actual modern tradition, the expansion of the suffrage, is just expanding the crumbs and the participants uh, in the Bonapartist authoritarian state. It's just democratizing the Bonapartist state. Right? It's not the elimination of that state and the full coming into its own of civil society. So um, uh, uh, to, to conclude all of this, to go to your American Revolution point, what is the Constitution? The Constitution is the attempt right, to basically allow um, for free voluntary association life. That is individuals to freely contract and exchange and associate voluntarily with one another to set up churches, schools, businesses, enterprises, towns, municipalities, what have you, right? Free, as freely as they want to, and um, to prevent, right, uh, not only the creation of an arbitrary state power by checks and balances and dividing up the government, right, sending out federal executive legislature, but also preventing a tyranny in the majority, that is guaranteeing certain fundamental individual rights secure in the Bill of Rights, beyond which no uh, majority can go. The idea here being, of course, right, the idea that you want to be in a political order, right, that irrespective of what rung in it you're born into, through no fault of your own, you can determine the course of your own life, right, and you'll be given some basic individual rights which 99.99% of the rest of society cannot trample over, right? Does that make sense? Does that okay. uh, all make sense, people? Okay. So you wanted to say something I can see. I mean, that is... So uh, if we just jump into the discussion, there's so yeah. many several different ones. But I think that is the, 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 the core of sort of the bourgeois revolution, right? Of the bourgeois project. It's this formal equality. You know, it's formal equality to do whatever you want to, uh, to have a private life and private contracts, which are all have to do with the idea of private property. And it's this fiction that everybody's labor is, is equal. You know, and it's, it's sort of like exchangeable, you know, there's no difference. And also, of course, that all properties are equal, which, which really is a historical fiction. And so, um, I, I'm not so sure about the, when you said the, the, Mar the Marxists would not have had a problem with criticizing, with adopting a conservative point of view that simple majority rule can also be tyranny. Is that what you were trying to say? I, I, yeah. I, I was trying to say... A classical Marxism would have understood the fear as much as absolute monarchy or arbitrary royal despotism. They would have also understood mobocracy. I don't. I, I'm not sure about that because I think. Yeah, in the I, abs I, I think it's never a, a, like in the abstract. You know whether a majority rule in the abstract can be a tyranny. It's always a concrete historical situation. So is it a tyranny if in 1853 or so the majority of the, the French peasantry you know votes for Napoleon, or is that 
is that you know some sort of Bonapartist dictatorship of the majority over the workers in the cities? It would I'm, not, I'm not sure. It seems to me that the that the problem that happened in the 19th century is that universal suffrage and the idea of the democratic republic went from being a, a radical notion to essentially a conservative notion that we have today. In other words, it turned out that you have a democratic republic and that it doesn't threaten per se the ruling class, at least not in some advanced capitalist society, right? We live in a, the United States is a democratic republic by the standards of the 1790s, right? So was France. Like in that sense, the Jacobin program was realized, but now it's a banality, right? But I don't think that, I'm not sure that, but it's not about mobocracy. I mean, in fact, like what I think sh would have shocked almost everybody in the 19th century was how conservative universal suffrage turned out to be because people imagined that the masses would be much more politically active. And that was a discovery of the middle and late 19th century. But I, I guess like what I what I wanted to get into, and I guess like it goes back also to the to the question of elites. I mean, one of the things that's clear, particularly about the French Revolution, is the extent to which it was a process largely the revolutionaries were themselves part of the most relatively privileged section of French society, right? And one of the paradoxes you have, you mentioned the Vendée, is that, of course, many of the least privileged people could be in Europe in the late 18th, early 19th century, could be enlisted for radical Catholic counter-revolution, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that also, I think, clearly plays into this question of democracy, particularly for the Jacobins, right? Like, it, in other words, you couldn't, the Jacobins could count on, say, the sans culottes but they couldn't necessarily count on the French peasantry as supporting some kind of radical democratic project, right? It might have been that in 1793, if you had a democratic election in France, it just would have brought back some kind of right-wing Catholic regime if you'd just been able to hold a popular vote, right? Aside from military intervention. And I mean, I think that that theme of democracy is also what haunts the Bolsheviks. It's Ignacio? Yeah. Uh, look, can we... Yeah, go time, ahead. Best question, also have a collective discussion yeah, now. I'm just, just the thing is, the, yeah. you have to remember that, that wider vision. I mean, we, we can get into all the specifics about the Vendée and about Catholic counter-revolution, all of that. I'm not dismissing any of that. But I think in the picture we're trying to talk about here of this wider bourgeois revolution, we have to keep in mind is there's a conception amongst bourgeois radicals of the 18th century, right? That there will be a progressive unfolding global division of labor in a world market that will include more and more people, <clears throat> right, in the development of the productivity of labor, the development of material welfare, of consum consumer abundance, that essentially, if you'll forgive me, what I like to call the three Ps will set in, right? Peace, prosperity, progress, that you will essentially have people increasingly com commercially interconnected with one another through a world market global division of labor and they won't go to war anymore that end of coercion on the world stage prosperity that people will come in from the countryside come in from more patriarchal and paternal forms of labor and regulation into the free market and participants into it with jobs of higher productivity mm. and higher wages p prosperity and then progress that this will develop over time right and the problem when we use this anachronistic conception of democracy, so we go back, we look at somebody like Immanuel Kant, so we look at somebody like Benjamin Franklin, who explicitly talk about you can't, you know, who have worries about the, you know, who have worries about extending the suffrage to people that don't have merit. Now, what they mean by, and this is what's so important, is you have to treat what they're saying in its context, which is the 18th century. And in that context, we have a world still largely of hereditary status, where people's lot in life is determined by their birth. Hereditary status, mm. whether it's you're, you're not an aristocratic nobleman, so you can't participate in political life, you can't participate in virtue and honor, or the two greatest hereditary statuses of the time, slavery for people of African descent, and of course the greatest hereditary status in the history of the world since the Neolithic Revolution, women. 
right? That essentially it's a world governed by hereditary status. And what they're arguing for by saying you should basically have full political rights Gender with, is not based hereditary status. on merit. I said the position of women in society <laughs> is the greatest hereditary status since the Neolithic Revolution, right? That basically that 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 what they're arguing by when they say based on merit, that is democratic. Meaning for them, the view is it should not be based on what you're born as, but it should be based on the fact that you're able to achieve through successful exchange and enterprise a bit of property, that you become stable, self-possessed, self-determining, and that allows you the political rights of determination. But there's no definite line. The old regime has a definite line across which you can't cross. When you shift to that bourgeois radical conception of meritocracy, Right. The idea is that it's potentially, let me just finish, Richard. anybody can cross <clears throat> it, right? come into it, cross it. right? And the sense is that, that, that you will not have an interest, and this is the fear of mobocracy, if you just give it to everybody, you will not have an interest, you have an interest in that continuing progressive unfoldment. Right? Do, you under, do you follow what I'm saying of, of this kind of increasingly free, self-developing civil society? And the point I'm trying to make here is, that this is why we have to stress, stress the classical Marxist notion that bourgeois society comes into crisis in the 19th century with the Industrial Revolution and the full constitution of capitalism. Because then, right, basically society has come into contradiction with itself. And the unfolding global division of labor and world market are not going to achieve those things. And it's in that context that you have the recrudescence of the state. Society can't govern itself so it sets up a power above itself, beyond itself, the Bonaparte state that will govern itself for it. And modern democracy plays out in that context. It's just the democratization of that state, right? But I, I, so that's what I want to stress. Not, not that it was, it depends what you mean, Ignacio, but this term historical fiction, right? Yeah. I would say it's, it's now an ideology. It's been rendered ideological. That is, we act in 2018 as if though, um, key developments of the 19th century never occurred. We act as if, though, it's still possible, right, to achieve in the context of our fundamental social relations that world of peace, prosperity, and progress. Oh, but it was already like impossible in the 18th, in the 18th century, right? And in the I, I wouldn't century. say that. As that's what we would well, disagree. I mean, I, mean, I mean, in the sense that if you are a Frenchman in 18 in, in 1750 and People say, you know, if only people were free, they could, you know, uh, have the arts and crafts and do all that. Yeah. That's, that's total fiction. You know, it, it depends where you're born, if you have land, if you don't have land, if you're, you know, if you're African or not. Uh, so there's never this, this free play of, oh, you just work your way up, you know, you're just clever and this kind of stuff. It's relative. It's becoming more, so, I mean, it's, okay, it's, but it only ever for a very small major, minority of people and only in the cities and at the cost of, the, the costs are completely you know, widely externalized all over the world. And so the other thing that struck me when you said the Atlantic, you know, sort of center of the Bolshevik Revolution, these are also the centers of imperialist and colonialist expansion. Mm -hmm. So it's, I mean, in capital accumulation, you know, through the modern technologies of like uh, navigation and seafaring and all this kind of stuff. So it's no, it's no surprise that England and Holland are the centers of that. Mm -hmm. And it, there, there's a relationship with that, right? Because what actually makes it possible for people to have merit you know, to get ahead in the world, to have these free contexts, is just this merchant capital, which then later becomes industrial capital. You know, so mm -hmm. without that, you don't really have anything. You know, in in Poland, you know, you, you have a completely different economy. And I think people in Poland in the 1800s to talk about uh, the Enlightenment, they have very different ideas. Well, I mean, actually, I would say that people in Poland who were aware of the Enlightenment had surprisingly similar ideas, even despite the 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 difference of social context. Uh, I mean, let, let me say, it probably had a very different meaning what they were saying, even if they didn't think it had different meaning. You know, they were probably part of a global, of a, of a European discourse on the Enlightenment. But I think uh, this is all Wallerstein, you know, so different, like, areas in Europe and in the world with different economies. Um, so what was possible in, like, states like France and uh, Holland and England wasn't possible anywhere else. Well, oh, I mean, okay, okay, I mean, I, I, so I guess I'm like this three corner. So I don't, I think I would disagree with Wallerstein's analysis, but I guess like I do vis-a-vis -vis you, James, have this question. Well, what about Babeuf? What about 
the people who kind of saw the crisis of Jacobinism and said, well, the problem with Jacobinism was that it didn't go far enough. It didn't have a social revolution along with a democratic impulse, right? So isn't that like the beginning in some sense, the 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 prehistory of like a Marxist tradition somewhere? That realization of Jacobinism didn't go far enough, which in some respects is the kind of the opposite insight from Constant, right? The Jacobinism which is also assimilated to the Marxist tradition. Jacobinism was premature. It didn't distinguish between ancient and modern liberty. All of that also exists in the Marxist tradition. And then the other question is, well, what about things like the Haitian Revolution, right? Which are in some respects a, a product of the French Revolution. And, and what about like the question of then, well, what is the meaning of that? What is the meaning of these Atlantic revolutions in the 20th and 21st century. So when Palmer writes, he speaks about the world revolution happening in the 20th century. He's writing like in the 50s, right? And he's talking about, you know, the decolonization in the third world, the Cold War, the the conflict between the appeal of like the Soviet Union and liberal capitalism, right? And he's on the side of liberal capitalism, right? Liberalism. But looking at it like some 60 years later, you ask yourself, well, do people even feel that there's some kind of world revolution occurring, right? Do people now even have the sense of some kind of ideological connection to that world of democratic revolution that they did in the 50s, either because they were defending Western liberal democracy or because they were pro-Soviet or Stalinist or some kind of Marxist? And I'm not sure that they do. And I think that that's a problem. Let me. T- well, you're gonna, yeah. Yeah, you're gonna ask. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I didn't. But also. Sorry. Yeah. Does anyone else want to pitch in? I just want to say one quick thing to you, Richard, because you keep bringing back Babouf. I do not mean to make any distancing from Babouf. All I'm trying to be critical of is we're in the world of 2018. Okay. All of this stuff is lost. I mean, discussion of the bourgeois revolution is, I think, this is called, this conversation is called the bourgeois revolution today. So what does the bourgeois revolution mean for classical Marxism? What I think we have to recover and try and preserve for the future is not the important distinctions between a Babouf, a Robespierre, to his right a Danton, to his right a Lafayette, if I can use that term loosely, right? But rather what Lafayette, Danton, Robespierre, and Babouf all share in this wider bourgeois revolutionary experience, because there's a vision of human emancipation there that for all of their differences and disagreements and conflicts that risk being lost when we get into the trees, right, of the differences between them rather than forest of what they share, which is this wider bourgeois revolutionary experience. Let me, and, but let me go to Ignacio's point. Ignacio, I, I don't disagree with what you said. I just have a different take on it. But I could take the thread of slavery and connect it to Richard's concern about the Haitian Revolution. There's absolutely no question that what you call this, what I was referring to as the rise of bourgeois society, you're calling the era of merchant capital before full-blown capitalism with what you called industrial capital. There's no question that that's a brutal period, massive expropriation of lands from indigenous people throughout the Americas, um, the transatlantic slave trade, which reduces a significant portion of West Africa to human capital, essentially, chattel. Um, uh, uh, Massive dislocations of people, terrible crossings of plebeian immigrant labor from Europe across the Atlantic. All of that. It's a brutal, catastrophic experience. This this massive encounter between the peoples of Western Europe, West Africa, and uh, the Native Americas. Right? But I think what I'm trying to point to in this concept of the classical bourgeois revolutions and the victory of bourgeois society, right? The political victory of bourgeois society and the bourgeois revolution. I'm not trying to say that, that, I'm not trying to say in other words, or if I, let me go back to the issue of slavery. There's no question that the rise and development of the slave trade, beginning with the Portuguese and Spanish age of exploration. There's no question that that is integral to the constitution of merchant capital to the development of the world market, the global division of labor, that that makes possible the kind of commercial and manufacturing and urban networks that allow for the full development of bourgeois society in Europe. There's no question that slavery is integral to that. 
But what I'm trying to say is that the sum is greater than its parts and is in fact more emancipatory than its parts. What I mean by that is what transatlantic slavery as a wider part of the wider bourgeois society makes possible is the development of a consciousness, right? in the reading public, in the world of coffee houses and salons and debates and pamphlets and literature of an idea, right? That regardless of what lot in life you're born into, you can through the exercise of your reason if freed from the coercion of others, participate in an intellectual and cultural world. Let me just finish where you can have distance from your social background and where you can critically reflect on your relationship to yourself, to the world around you, to others. Right. And to participate in that. And that makes possible the development of this radical bourgeois subjectivity, this radical bourgeois consciousness that then, although it would not have come into being in the world, that world of the reading public, that world of collective critical consciousness, because what the Enlightenment essentially is, is just society having conversation about itself. The reason why the European Enlightenment is so important is I would argue it's the first time on a mass base society has had a conversation about itself, meaning not as part of the cosmos, part of the divine order, rather as self-understood as a society. People in the 18th century European Enlightenment begin to say, there is such a thing as society, we are constituted by our social relations, and begin to have a critical discussion on how to change them in order to improve things. This is not a discussion about the gods, about fate, about anything like that. Rather, it's a discussion about society itself. That's what's going on in this public sphere in the world of enlightenment, is society having a conversation about itself and becoming conscious of how it determines itself and how it can redetermine itself. Historically, I mean, you could counterfactually say, could this have come into being without slavery? I don't know. It doesn't interest me. Slavery, the expropriation of indigenous peoples, the catastrophic encounters between Western Europeans, West Africans, and Native Americans is how this actually did get constituted. But once it was constituted, it was greater than all of that. And it made possible a criticism of all forms of exploitation and oppression. Not just one specifically of European males. You get by the great age of the Atlantic Revolution thoroughgoing critiques of slavery. You get, for the first time, real collective social discussions of women's emancipation with things like Mary Wollstonecraft's Vindication of the Rights of Woman, right? Um, and most, you know, that, 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 that what we begin to see come online there by the second half of the 18th century is actual critique of slavery, right? You get abolitionism with people talking about the fact that essentially, right, uh, 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 that, you know, b b being able to criticize one of the pillars of the economic world that allowed them to have this consciousness in the first place, if that makes sense. And, and, and we get this age of abolitionism where essentially um, 1793, the slave trade and slavery are abolished in France. You know, people poo-poo the Jacobin period as, you know, period of terror and totalitarianism, not you, Richard, but the Cold War tradition. Jacobin period um, has pe people of both, um, uh, uh, you know, biracial and African descent sitting in the National Convention, right, in the first democratic constitution really, in the history of the world being enacted um, uh, in, in the modern sense. Um, uh, uh, and you're, you get the abolition of slavery throughout the French Empire. You get um, the, the rise of the abolition movement in Britain, the abolition of slave trade in 1807, abolition of slavery 1830s. And what in this country is referred to as the founders, clearly, through the constitutional settlement, do not eliminate slavery, but put it on the road, what they think, as Marx said, the road to elimination. As he says, if you if anybody doubts this, just go on Marxist.org and read Marx's um, letter. He wrote it on behalf of the First International to Abraham Lincoln on the occasion of his re-election in 1864. I think it's like from January 1865 or something. The First International goes in, the working committee goes in and delivers it to Adams, the ambassador, the U.S. ambassador in London, to congratulate Lincoln and, you know, and, and lays out the founders clearly set the United States on the road to eliminating slavery. They were people of the Enlightenment. They thought it was a barbaric institution. However, they were worried about the consequences of eliminating it immediately. How do you get rid of it, eliminate it immediately? It's economically essential to everything, right? Um, not just to the South, but Wall Street is basically all about financial dealings on slave-produced commodities to a huge degree. New England mercantile shipping and slave-produced commodities. The point of all of this is to say is they set up a train for its eventual extinction. They think basically the kind of social political order they've constituted, slavery would be slowly reduced. They set up the elimination of the slave trade. 
and eventually they think over time it will be gone. You get the Industrial Revolution in Britain. This is why this is so important in those mills of Lancashire that demand from places like Birmingham and Manchester for cotton, raw cotton. And it's that that then produces this insatiable appetite for raw cotton and slavery. And slavery has a new birth. And rather than being set on the road to extinction, slavery becomes fundamental by the 1820s and the so-called slave power begins to become all powerful in the federal government. And basically prior to the Civil War is about to turn the federal government into one gigantic slave catcher, essentially. Hence, you know, provoking the Civil War. I, the reason why I'm repeating this narrative is it's fundamental, I think, to understand that something really happened in the 18th century. That there was a awareness of slavery. Now, there, while there was slavery, there was the first time the awareness of slavery has forever been wrong and should be eliminated everywhere. That consciousness, that spark dawns and people set up manumission and abolition societies and they fund colleges and schools and people like Alexander Hamilton, Richard wanted to go to the play, you know, work really hard in the New York Manumission Society, get rid of abolition to set up colleges for the education of free blacks, to try and set up colleges like Colgate University upstate for Native Americans. That that's a real moment, and they think they're putting in the long road to eliminating slavery, and it's with the Industrial Revolution and that insatiable need for raw cotton, and that contradiction of bourgeois society, where you get the rise in development of biological racism around the kind of recrudescence of slavery, etc. cetera, if, if, if that makes sense. And, and the reason why I'm emphasizing all this point is the Confederacy or the Southern Secessionist movement has to reject the Constitution, has to break with the tradition of the bourgeois republic in the United States because they recognize deeply and profoundly that that republic is founded on the Enlightenment and the universality of the rights of man. And therefore, they don't buy that anymore. Right? They're saying this was wrong, this was an illusion. Jefferson should have never declared that. Right. Not all people are equal. And ergo, their whole view is that Republican tradition has to be departed from. And why I'm saying all this, just say I'm not talking about what you're talking about. Of course, you have to look at historical specificity, but historical specificity, there really arose the critique of all human slavery in the 18th century. That is a profound, I think, massive intellectual and cultural achievement. There were real practical moves to eliminate slavery. It was eliminated from all the mid-Atlantic uh, uh, and, and, and northern states um, by the early 19th century. Uh, there was the, re the curtailment of the slave trade. The Royal Navy was sent out at cost of life and limb to blow okay. away Portuguese slave ships. This all really happened. Okay. And, and, and I think it's worth defending the memory of that against what, what comes later. And I think the left has participated too much in the 20th century, to be frank, with the old right in bearing the memory of that kind of stuff and saying it was never really about that, right? What it was always really about was a particular assertion of a white male private property oligarchy or what have you, if that makes sense. Can right? I? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> okay, so you've defended a notion of the bourgeois revolution. Of course, a lot of what you've defended also sounds like a defense of the Enlightenment, right? So it seems you have like three processes going on in modernity. You have a scientific revolution, which ultimately transforms the world technically, later an industrial revolution. You have the Enlightenment, and you have specific bourgeois revolutions. But the specific bourgeois revolutions are also specific political events, right? And so, for example, we talk about the American and French revolutions here, right? The two great revolutions of the late 18th century. Now, there's a, I, I will like here use the devil's advocate. I'm not ad taking my own position, which would say, well, it didn't really matter that there was an American Revolution or a French Revolution, and maybe the world would have been better off if they hadn't occurred. For example, this is a scholar who's a black sort of new leftist scholar, Gerald Horn, whom you know, who... The counter-revolution. Right, the counter-revolution. I'll just explain that. Okay, so the, basically the argument is that it's a... I don't buy this argument. I think it's kind of crazy, but that that it was a, 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 a rebellion in defense of slaveholding. Right? Because preemptively, they knew preemptively. abolition was coming. Okay, right? which yeah. I don't, which I think is is nonsense. But however, suppose that there had not been an American Revolution, America had stayed part of the British Empire. Well, in the British Empire, slavery was abolished a generation before uh, the Civil War. Maybe the British Empire would have abolished slavery. That would have slavery would have been abolished peacefully in 1833 instead of through a civil war in the 1860s, and you would have had a single English-speaking state 
which would have become progressively more democratic and through various reform acts. And then eventually, why would you need an American revolution? Similarly, there's a longstanding Anglo-American and I guess conservative French tradition that sees the French Revolution and then the pole political turmoil of the 19th century is a terrible mistake. Why did you need this? You could have had some peaceful uh, Anglo-Saxon type tradition towards a more democratic society, right? Now, counter to that, a Marxist tradition has insisted on, you know, the political importance of the actual revolution. Now, the question I have in terms of your narrative is it seems to downplay the political aspect in terms of the broader cultural aspect of what one might call the Enlightenment and bourgeois society. Mm -hmm. So I'm sort of curious, how would you defend what I would call the political importance of these revolutions to someone who is skeptical? To like, why is it a good thing that there was an American and French revolution? Three why does it make, why did it make the world better? Three things. One, um, the Enlightenment it makes bourgeois society aware of itself, or civil society aware of itself. The, the first concepts of bourgeois society and bourgeois revolution are developed in the Enlightenment. That's, that, that's the coming into awareness of itself of bourgeois society, of civil... I want to stress, bourgeois society means civil society. They're the same thing. I want to really stress that. Now, in a fully developed civil society, you will have a wider bourgeois class. You will have more merchants and manufacturers. But you should not reduce bourgeois society or civil society to the bourgeois class. They simply are in greater abundance and greater prominence in a society of greater social freedom of a self-developing civil society. And there was no anticipation of this before. So there is an inherent connection between Enlightenment and bourgeois revolution. It is itself, the Enlightenment is actually the first people to, it's Enlightenment theorists that first theorize the earlier Dutch revolt and English revolution as kinds of bourgeois revolutions. Now that all being said, the American Revolution has unfortunate necessity. Richard, that is the perspective of the American revolutionaries themselves. That is George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, Benjamin Rush, Alexander Hamilton, these people would have been happy and thrilled to be part of the British Empire, which Benjamin Franklin famously called the greatest political structure human wisdom has ever erected, right? He says that during the Seven Years' War, right? They would have been happy to remain part of that, <clears throat> right? Because they think this is a society, you know, there's this Atlantic civil society developing that they're free. The problem is the British state, after the Seven Years' War, its ministers and officials, move in a way to basically erect a authoritarian regime in the colonies. Now, I don't want to get into all the details of this, but let me just say something very quickly. Having written a book on Pr this. Prior to the Seven Years' <laughs> War, the uh, 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 colonies, for particular reasons, develop se semi-autonomously politically, and they basically have their own colonial assemblies and legislatures, and the royal governors that come over from Britain have no money. And the way they need to get money is they need to go to the elites and the representatives in the assemblies and legislators and ask them for money. And that means the elites and the assemblies and legislators say, well, if, you're gonna, if you want us to raise it from our people, you need to tell us what you want to spend it on. And then negotiation sets up. And essentially what happens is the governors only do things that the legislatures and the assemblies want. So basically, just like in Britain... In colonial America, you have these little parliaments that make these little monarchs, the royal governors, responsible to civil society. You, royal governor of Massachusetts, instead of ruling in your own interest, in the interest of the crown of Britain, will only give you money if you spend it on stuff that we're convinced is going to better reproduce civil society as a whole, right? Uh, expand the western frontiers for more settlers, um, better commercial ports and harbors, right? That kind of stuff, Why right? Why just like in Britain? Because in Britain, you have a monarch controlled by parliament. Right. Right. So in the colonies, you have a royal governors. Republic, in the view of many contemporaries, you have the royal governors uh, controlled by little parliaments. Right. These little legislatures. But the reforms that the British try and introduce after the Seven Years' War basically are going to allow the British Parliament, which has no elected representatives from America, right, whatsoever, that British Parliament will be able to vote taxes directly on the colonies, mm. collect those taxes. And then pay the British generals, the British admirals, and the royal governors that rule the colonies. The problem with that is, essentially, you're going to take the imperial state in North America. The royal governors, the customs collectors, the judges, all of that. Who are appointed by the crown. And now you're going to pay them with the tax raised by the parliament in London. Which means they no longer have to go to the colonial assemblies and ask them for money. Because guess what? The parliament in London run by aristocrats in London 
is the one raising their money. So this is basically the kind of recolonization of America, meaning you're basically going to make the colonies subject to whatever the mother country needs. Does this make sense to everybody? So that's what the imperial forms that trigger the American Revolution are going to do. They're basically going to cut out the colonial assemblies by allowing a parliament in London run by bewigged aristocrats, landed elites, to directly tax the colonies and then pay all the money for the people the crown appoints to run the colonies. And without having to tear down a single legislature, you never have to, they'll just become talk shops. Nobody will ever have to consult them again. Hmm. Now you could say, oh, this is because these elites in this legislature are really pissed off. This is why you get an American Revolution. But those legislatures are which are holding the British crown and the empire to, to acting for the general welfare of civil society as a whole in the colonies. And if you allow these reforms to happen, basically that means that the imperial state is no longer going to be responsible to colonial civil society, right? The imperial state is only going to care about Britain. It's not going to care about the American colonies at all. And you'll extract taxes and wealth from the American colonies however you need it, even if that destroys society there. You violate private pro They're stationing 10,000 troops there. They're putting redcoats in people's homes. They're violating freedoms and civil rights. But you won't care. It's not because there's some evil conspiracy. It just will set up a structure over time where the imperial state, the crown officials, simply don't care about civil society in the colonies. And rather they care about what's going on in Britain. You get the, that's why they have to trigger the American Revolution. So long story short, the reason why there's an American Revolution is because there's no British Revolution in the later 18th century. Meaning, basically, there's a, 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 there, there is a desire to reform the British state to make it even more responsive to civil society. That, that with the radicals and reformers in the 1760s and, and you 70s see the, in Britain. And you see the, the French Revolution is also defensive? Yeah, broadly, yes. So I mean, the French Revolution, makes... the Jacobins rise to power in the context of, 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 as you know this, the radical Republicans, not just the Jacobins, but more broadly the radical Republicans as a whole, rise to power in the, con in the context of Britain essentially joining the counter-revolutionary so forces. So you're saying if, the, if, these re if these bourgeois revolutions had not occurred, that we'd just be living in a much more authoritarian world? No, I'm saying if the leading bourgeois, if, if the most successful world, if the, if the leading bourgeois power of the 18th century, Great Britain, which at that point is the most globally successful country in political and economic terms the world had ever seen in terms of its reach economically and politically, if it had, had, a rev if it had reformed itself, if its elites had further reformed itself, or in the absence of its elites further reforming itself, there had been another successful revolution there, it would have not been necessary to either have the American Revolution in the colonies at all, whatsoever, or it would the French Revolution would not have taken the course it took. You make me think that uh, the American Revolution was just like Brexit. What do you mean? So in the sense that, you know, Boris Johnson, who just resigned, said... Uh, if we accept the EU uh, demands, you know, for the Brexit yeah. uh, negotiations, we'll be economy. What he means is that, you know, we have to accept laws made in Brussels for the duration. Yes. And we don't want that because we won't have any say in it. Yeah. So you, you're saying this is the same with the American colonies. You know, they won't accept law being made in London without them being asked for it. Yeah. The only difference being, though, is Boris Johnson yeah. is saying that. Yeah. Um, yeah as, of course. It's, 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 no, but Boris Johnson, yeah. no, I, I don't yeah. think he's lying. He's saying that, yeah. but it's ideological because it's basically um, acting as if, though, the problem is in capitalism, right? Where I'm trying George to say, Washington. when, yeah. when George Washington and Alexander Hamilton do this, the problem is not capitalism. The problem is the uh, political elites in Britain. That is the problem, right? That is the problem. And because radicals and reformers in Britain cannot dislodge their own elites and reform their own state, Right. And in fact, you basically get a conservative reaction, Britain, which is going to last from the era of the American Revolution through to the defeat of Napoleon. Right. Because of that, the colonial American leaders are forced to turn on to their own resources. And they're saying, if we can't have this more broadly liberal British Empire, then we have to leave the British Empire. Hence the movement for independence. But that generally is what that was about. Right. Boris Johnson is acting as if though, and here we can turn what we wanted to get to finally, what it, you know, the echoes of the bourgeois revolution down the ages. Boris Johnson is acting as if though Brussels is ultimately the problem, right? I mean, that, that, that is, of course, what he says about Brussels is true. There's an unelected, unaccountable bureaucracy, the European Commission, right, that basically um, sets laws and dictates across the, your, 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 the EU. And beyond that, 
all of the prime ministers and presidents of different countries that want to be able to get things done at a European level that they can't do at their national level gather at the European level to put it through because there's a fig leaf joke parliament that meets in Strasbourg that has no say whatsoever. So if you're the prime ministers and presidents of Europe and you want to do things, you go to the Brussels level and you get that done through there and then it's imposed back on your own national parliaments. But that's not because the EU is trying to set up an autocracy the way the British land elite were doing in the 18th century in the colonies. That's because the EU is obviously, right, dealing with um, the a, a, a new, I mean, the reoccurring crisis of capitalism through its specific expression in the 1970s, um, where essentially it triggered from being this Keynesian project, Keynesian Fortis project, the European Union, to becoming this kind of neoliberal iron cage, right, imposing austerity and marketization across the continent, etc. So anyway, I'm sorry, I babbled well, off yeah, the deep end. It's, but it's yeah. important because the question is whether the bourgeois, the bourgeois revolutions in America and then later in France are sort of progressive or not, right? And in with Brexit, you can argue it's actually the British government, the current British government with its neoliberal policies that's far to the right of the EU in terms of social politics, uh, austerity, you know, capital regimes, all this kind of stuff. So they they exit in the EU because it's too restrictive for them. They want to do more stuff, you know, well, more sort of wild capitalist stuff. Traditionally, yeah. the far left in Britain, as elsewhere, has supported opposed the European Union. Yeah, I think they're wrong about that. Okay, well that's but I'm just saying yeah. that that it's not a simple question, therefore, of left and right, because politically in Britain it's the left wing of the Labour Party and people to the left of that, and the right wing of the Conservative Party that are pro Brexit. Yeah. I mean, I mean, Jeremy Corbyn was ambivalent about Right, it. Jeremy Corbyn, Corbyn was previously... Yeah. Right, but, so, but, but leaving aside Brexit, I guess like the question I have is, well, yes, but look at Europe, right? I mean, the standard of Europe is that the member states, right, the concept of a European Union, mm -hmm. of, a, of a federation or whatever, of a nation of de either democratic republics or... or constitutional monarchies that are effectively democratic republics, even if they have some fig leaf monarch like Britain or Belgium or whatever, that that standard of how to organize society is, of course, a product of the age of bourgeois revolution. Absolutely. But then the question becomes like, there's a way in which this narrative becomes, well, is our modernity like I think people take it for granted that some as that these aspects of modernity were inevitable. I think that like people take it for granted. Well, of course we're in favor of democracy. We're in favor of republics. We're in favor of human equality. We're in favor of civil society. Mm -hmm. Right? Those are ideas that, except for very marginal elements like on maybe the far right, would generally be supported. Right? Less for fascists maybe. Mm -hmm. But. The question becomes like, like, what is the, the, the specific political character? And implicit in the notion of a bourgeois revolution, particularly in the Marxist tradition, is the comparison to a proletarian revolution, right? So classical Marxism sees the bourgeoisie doing something through the bourgeois revolution that the proletariat needs to do through a proletarian revolution, right? And I guess the question becomes like, like, can one imagine an alternative modernity where the bourgeois revolutions failed, where there weren't any bourgeois revolutions? Would would you would it still be possible to have an aristocratic society, or would sort of the development of capitalism have just undermined that and led to something like the present? I mean, listen, you know the details. Of this I would just say that the 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 fundamental point of departure for class of Marxism that is its fundamental question is. Um, why is the bourgeois revolution not enough, right? But well, that goes the, the, back hold on, to the, hold on, the but that, point. That no, see, it doesn't. That's where we fundamentally disagree. Um, by not enough does not mean that they didn't go far enough, but rather means why does the world constituted by the bourgeois revolution, right? Why is the world constituted by the bourgeois revolution the way it is? And you can interpret that in one of two ways, or I think where I disagree, you can say. It didn't go far enough because the people who enunciated these ideals, these universal ideals of liberté, égalité, fraternity, mm. were really masking a class interest mm -hmm. or for today's flavor of identity politics, a, a race or gender or what have you interest, 
right? But, but, um, you know, that's the problem, right? Okay. Now, of course, this is degenerated even further because at least amongst academic leftists, now it used to be academic leftists said, oh, well, it's masking a class interest or a race interest or a gender interest. Now it's even more degenerate. And they say, oh, it's the universalism is itself that's the problem. Universalism is horrible, right? That these ideals themselves are. The, I, I would contend the classical Marxist argument is, is not that. It's asking, why is the world constituted by the bourgeois revolution, not an emancipated world? And, and that, but the, the, the response is not because they were really masking an interest and now we're going to tape up these great slogans and really fulfill them. But rather, right, that the, 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 these bourgeois revolutionary ideals themselves, right, are inadequate to the world they want to constitute. But right. the classical but that's, Marxists that's the wouldn't have seen any contradiction between yeah. those two perspectives. What? Classical Marxism. No, no, didn't... you're right. There's not a contradiction. But without the second perspective, I would argue that the first one means something entirely different and contrary to classical Marxism. If you don't have that second perspective, that much wider perspective, that bourgeois society has come into contradiction with itself in capitalism, Right. And you simply think that the bourgeois revolution was always a lie. It was always just a universal mask of a specific particular interest. European imperialism, elites, um, a class interest, right? Then the, you set up Stalinism and you set up all the different varieties of Stalinism today in identity politics and academic leftism, right? If, if that makes sense. Right. I mean, do you, do you see what I'm saying? You're right. You can ask this question about specific class forces. I don't deny that, but it has to be in the context of this much wider perspective. And the problem is, Richard, classical Marxism absolutely accepted this. But but I think what you do is that you, you, you what you what, what I'm charging you with is that we're in 2018. We're not in 1918. Right. Not even in 19 no, there's reasons why in 1918 we could emphasize what you want to emphasize. And we could bring up the Babouf point to, to the sky's the limits. But what I'm trying to say in 2018, that wider horizon of bourgeois emancipation is what needs to be recovered. And what you're calling for needs to be situated within that wider horizon. I mean, I have to say that in terms of the scholarship, what strikes me always is the extent to which both the mid 19th century, mid 20th century, rather Stalinist or Stalinist influenced scholarship and the liberal Cold War scholarship both shared assumptions that seem to me much better than the present. Like, I would be happy with either the liberal Cold War scholarship or the Stalinist scholarship because they're both, like, a lot better than the present scholarship. Well, they both actually believe in those ideals. They both, I believe in those ideals, and they both believe in the Enlightenment. And despite the difference between them, they actually tell together a more coherent story. So it's the really, for example, what always strikes me is the attack on the Jacobins is not a product so much of the Cold War and certainly not of like the 19th century bourgeois scholarship. It's really an attack of a kind of new leftism, although you have like elements of it in the Cold War. Just to give one anecdote Richard's talking about for those, you know, that are outside of academia, like it used to be like historical sociologists, sociologists debate why Africa is underdeveloped. And the Stalinists or the Marx, Wallerstein comes out of a kind of a, Stal he would not be self-described Stalinist, but a, a Stalinist, Maoist, third worldist tradition. The, that tradition and the Cold War liberals used to have very different views about why the third world was underdeveloped or Africa was underdeveloped and vicious debates with one another, but they both accepted the categories of development of underdevelopment. Today, having those lenses is Eurocentric imperialist. In other words, the native peoples of the world should be allowed to wallow in their misery because that's the glories of difference, right, et cetera. Um, it's, you know, I, that, that whole language of development would be seen as totally, right? I mean, people, See the point I'm getting that that itself would be the problem, right? Like development. I mean, this is a culturally rich world of all these great shades of misery and oh, poverty. Or and development and is criticized from an ecological yeah. perspective. Yeah. But I mean, what you were saying before, right? This, that in some sense is just a vulgarized expression of the sort of undigested contradiction in the in the liberal bourgeois project. Yeah. Right. So, and the, and, and the Marxists have always said, you know, the, the dialectical understanding is what is this contradiction? So, and, it, and it's not saying, oh, the Enlightenment was a fraud, 
you know, and it was not saying, oh, that when I said it was a historical fiction, you know, this idea of equality of all, the idea of mm -hmm. everybody can work to the marriage, it, it's a very real fiction. So it's it's really embodied in all the laws. You know, everybody really is free at that moment, you know, when the serfs are liberated and all that. They're really free. They just don't have any property, or some of them anyway. You know? So so it's it both. Like James yeah. is saying the opposite. So it's not a question what? about like embodying. It's not just a question of like the laws. It doesn't matter if they can vote necessarily. <laughs> the question is whether or not they can participate and have some, you know, potential to, uh, you know, uh, own themselves and develop themselves. Uh, it's like free individuals. Or to recognize. But that's the question of vote. civil society. So I was like, I was like going to ask you if you could sort of like talk about what you mean by civil society, because I think that that is like kind of a contentious question. Both Dan mm -hmm. is sort of raising it, but also Ignacio basically is like, well, when you say civil society, do you just mean the spoiled rich kids? It is sort of like that's like my no. interpretation Sorry. of your question, right? Uh, I mean, pr correct me if I'm wrong, but like it's like you're like because Ignacio is like, what civil society? You're just talking about these like rich kids. Uh, I'm not, not quite, but <laughs> okay. almost. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Or, so or like you know white man yeah. Eurocentric whatever uh, like yeah. any any flavor. Oh. Well, I mean, the, the idea of meritocracy, which is very much with us, right? If you just work hard, if you're smart, if you do everything right, you go to Harvard, you become a lawyer, you know, you, you, okay. you succeed in society. That is, that is that 18th century idea. Okay, but can I just point out that in a world of aristocratic privilege where people, where you couldn't get something <laughs> because, like, not there was not the illusion of meritocracy. There was, like, like, things are reserved for people i mean you know i was thinking like you know the again like like in that sense the the criticism of privilege right comes from that democratic impulse right now we have like arguments about things like white privilege or male privilege right, right. but like it's particularly the criticism of legal privilege and the notion that privilege is a bad thing right because privilege comes in the middle ages etymologically it's privilegas private laws Right. There was a time when society was based on the idea of privilege is the normal state of affairs. People should have different statuses. Right. I mean, this is something that I was trying to convey to someone in Platypus, a young woman, some time ago. I said, well, you realize that throughout most of human history and civilized society, people thought that people should be unequal. Right. Equality was the the absurd idea. It was inequality is the way things should be. Right. Uh -huh that held even with those on the lower runs of society? They, they seem to have accepted it. You don't know. <laughs> I mean, as far as one can tell, I mean, people accepted it. Yes. Because well, the let me give you an example. Richard will be very familiar with this. You look at medieval peasant revolts, they're not revolting to overturn the social system. They're revolting usually because some aristocrat or lord is actually doing something that is not in terms of feudal social relations, that is taking a tribute that's too much. They don't revolt saying, we don't want you to be feudal lord anymore. They're revolting saying, no, no, get the old tribute or dues from us, right? Well, Etc. One might also say that their revolt was limited to that because they didn't see anything further as being possible. Yes, exactly. The social order. But that's civil, the rise of civil society, attendant with that, is that consciousness that sees the possibility of something that doesn't exist. But or of because, making what exists in embryo greater and more fulfilled. But because even peasant society is not aggregate it is there is disaggregation it circles all the way down the peasants are also you know also a hierarchy yeah, yeah. that are like better and worse peasants but right. but what's right. what's striking okay is like aside from the people whom one doesn't necessarily hear from right first of all most of medieval society is not peasant revolts peasant revolts are like relatively rare that's why they're marked but the other thing is What's striking but is the exception that proves the right. Rule. What's what's striking is that the people we hear from, like let's say the educated, literate minority, who are still a minority in 18th century France, right? Those people basically universally thought that hierarchy and inequality was the way things had to be. And what's striking about like 18th century France is that you have a demand for meritocracy, right? You didn't have a demand for meritocracy anywhere really before the late 18th century. I mean... Here I have a British history question about the levelers and the diggers in the British Revolution.
So sort of these radical Puritans or factions of the radical Puritans. They anticipate. Then, they anticipate the 18th century. This yeah. is kind of like Babouf. Yeah. yeah. No, but also also sort of like this radical organization in the army, right? The New Model Army, when they have the Putney debates, when they actually debate all this stuff, they have yeah. ideological debates and they close it in sort of like radical Protestant terms, you know. But they, it's like this amazing moment which I I sort of think is under researched. I don't know. Maybe it's not actually under research, but it's not really written about. I mean, it's not really part of Marxist like. Sort of yeah, there's a whole only British Marxist. The new left tried to recover. It's only the only people Marxist who write about it are British yeah. Marxist historians. <laughs> the new I, left I, tried I to recover. This, it. I read Hill. this book about yeah. the Latinos, yeah. which is not a good book. You know, is that Chris? What was it, Christopher, Christopher Hill? Or I, no, not that. No, the, the other, other guy. The other uh, guy, yeah. Yeah, the, the other guy. Oh, the guy that yeah. Yeah, writes in PR sometimes, David Bruce Black. Black. Didn't he write about yeah. the levelers? I don't know. No, no, I have it on my. Um, the guy who wrote the book on the Chartists. Anyway, so I think it's this amazing moment of self-consciousness. Mm-hmm. Right in the Putnam debates, it's like we're here. We are going to decide how society is going to be, how po- politics is going to be. You know, and what happens to the uh, people who lose the debate? They get hanged. You know, that's that's how it works. You know, you win the debate, you put everything at stake for words, really, you know, not for property, not for getting a job or something like that. You know, so it's really this high moment of of revolutionary engagement. Uh, yes. Quite extraordinary. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. But what's interesting about that moment? Is that then, then that moment is still very geographically confined. I mean, what's interesting about the late 18th century moment is it has this international character and particularly through the French Revolution takes in the whole European and parts of the non-European world. And then, like, in that sense, it, it's almost as though Britain seems premature. And also the other thing that I find striking about that the two moments is of course that the later moment is expressed in a secular mm-hmm. language, right. which I think no, no longer backward. Yeah. it's it's no longer expressed in a religious millennial language. It's expressed in terms of secular language about the organization of society. Can, can I say two quick things? Somebody, Dan, you had asked, or Gabe, somebody said definition of civil society. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, obviously I, I kind of try, try to mean this kind of rich voluntary association of the world, but let me just do kind of crass essentials, if you just think of it this way, in sort of individual life or the oikos, the domestic households, you know, you kind of have a world of um, consent to, to one degree or another. What you do as an individual. The state is a public realm that is one of coercion. That is, at the end of the day, we all recognize, right, that the state's authority ultimately lies in coercion, the right of life and death, etc. cetera. Um, civil society is like the state, a collective realm, but unlike the state, not based on coercion, but on consent, meaning individuals freely contract, exchange, associate voluntarily with one another to set up collective entities beyond themselves. So um, what I mean by civil society is that social world constituted by free labor, freely exchanging, freely interacting, voluntarily associating individuals that both pursue their individual interests, but also crucially it's a public mm. world of interaction, dialogue, debate, exchange, entrepreneurship, labor, right? Where people freely associate. And they do constitute collectivities. But the collectivities are based on consent and people can freely come and go. I mean, the famous classic example in the bourgeois revolutionary age of civil society being constituted in one sphere is religious toleration, right? Whereas before... State coercion, you had to be a member of the king's church, right? That was essential. Religious toleration, as Locke famously develops it, the letter on toleration is the church is but a voluntary association. Mm. You join it, you set up rules for governing it, and therefore you should treat it like any other voluntary association, like a bake sale or like the Boy Scouts or what have you. You set it up. If it works for you, if you think it's the true path to salvation, it works. If it doesn't, you go join another one or you don't be a member of one whatsoever. Just to finish this point, the point I'm trying to say is it's not... I, I, I don't mean a world of rich kids. I mean a world of, 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 of a kind of rich, differentiated sociality where people freely exchange and associate with one another and create a collectivity beyond themselves in which the sum is greater than its parts, right? But it's ultimately consensual. And what I mean, I know I'm best, so I didn't mean to interrupt you, Nashua, but to finish this, what I meant by bourgeois revolution being political events where civil society conquers the state, what I literally mean is that we're this world of public association and consent of collectivities constituted by consent. Mm. 
right? That is a world in which they subject the political order based on coercion, so, right? So a constitutional republic created by the bourgeois revolution, such as famously in the American Revolution, is meant to create a state that does not rule over civil society, but provides the public framework for civil society. Everybody has rights to freely, religiously, and civilly associate with one another, set up businesses, set up churches, go and found new municipalities. You claim in upstate New York, you found a new Messiah, okay, you go westward and have Mormonism. You know, all of that, right? You know what I mean? That is what I mean about okay. a state if, allowing for that free if, development. If the, if the dramatic inversion of that, which is, yeah. I think you called it, uh, like a, a democrat, democratized Bonaparte state or something. Yeah. Right. So that would then, to me, it seems like it's suggesting that the, you know, what we were talking about earlier, universalism itself becomes a problem now. That seems like you know they they are essentially the same thing because I mean I was thinking about it as well. If you look at the early twentieth century, then there are several states in the world who believe that they have a vision for the rest of humanity. Right. right. So there's. Wilson, there's the Soviet Union, but there's also all the col colonial states and their colonies. Uh, after after 1950, so it's kind of interesting that that's the scholarship that still harkens back to that kind of you know worldview or recognition. But 1950 is also when Europe, like all the European states, start withdrawing and giving up uh, their stakes in all these parts. So you know, famously, they withdraw from the Middle East. So what you have now is the United States, the only country, and maybe peripherally. Russia today, but you know, first of all, there's only three countries in the world which have some world imagination for the whole world. There's US, there's Russia in whatever way it exists, and maybe China, right? There's no one else who's actually trying to imagine the world. And everyone is pulling out of the Middle East. So the US, the US's intervention in the Middle East today, so its relationship with Israel is ideological, as opposed to what's happening with the EU, which is purely an economic relationship, which is why they would support Iran even if Iran is going to become a nuclear state, because they don't actually care Sorry, what's the happening. The EU is purely an economic project? Is that well, it is actually the kind, it is the, it is the expression of, you know, universalism is still being a problem, because it becomes universal essential, what? universal becoming a problem, that, you know, you can't, universalism cannot be defended anymore, seemingly, in the academy. Now. The, yeah, okay. and European Union is essentially, you know, just a nationalist project. Which is which works as an economic engine together, uh, rather than you know, uh, rather than actually having any stakes in the world at all. So, I I just had a different question. I'm sorry to. That's an interesting topic. So you can respond to that. But I just wanted to ask you a, a historical question about the deep history. So if you go back before the era, you have like the feudal monarchies of Western Europe, and then you have like the ancient despotisms like Assyria and. Egypt, like the early states that are purely despotic. But you also have in the ancient world political types of entities like the Roman Republic, even more significantly like the Greek democracies, which at least in the imagination, in a kind of early modern imagination, become some kind of model for like the 18th century. The question is, how do you see the political trajectory of the ancient world? Not like Oh, Richard, theory. that's honestly, this is the bourgeois revolution today. I don't think we should go but, on. But, I'm, but, 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 but I, yes, but I, but I, okay. but my, because the reason I ask is, yes. and it goes back to the constant, right? The question is, there is a way in which the 18th century saw, like, models of the Roman Republic, the use of the word Senate, the, the, the idea of, like, ancient democracy, it, it saw some reflection of its own experience in the ancient world. Was that purely an ideological illusion? Or were there aspects of like ancient political society that uh, anticipated certain aspects of modernity? Do things like like the developments of political developments in the late Middle Ages, did they really have anything to do with the rise of bourgeois society or were they on some different plane? That's why I brought up like this whole like thing that I happened to come across about the Avis dynasty and, you know, 1385 and like a bourgeois revolution. And, <laughs> right. I'm like, really? I never, <laughs> you, you know, do you want to? Uh, uh, yeah. Well, it was just about kind of like, what are the, I wanted to hone in like, on what are kind of like the necessary conditions for the emergence of civil society or, mm -hmm. or bourgeois society. Like, I think you kind of pointed to like the development, like a certain amount of agricultural development and people like consolidating into larger like city centers and towns yeah. and then like the emergence mm -hmm. of like 
the literacy fuck? and like sort of decentralization of like the church as like the center of whatever. Like, but I feel like this was happening in places that weren't just Europe, right? Like, mm -hmm. also in China, even in Central America, there were like large, like, you know, the most population centers and stuff like that. The most the, urbanized part of the world in the Middle Ages yes. was certainly the, the Middle East. Right. So, um, what is specific, yeah, to like Europe in, you know, this late Middle Ages or something like that that enables like civil society to emerge? Or why didn't it emerge like in Rome or something like that, you know? So, I think what you say is 100% accurate. In fact, obviously, civilizations and cities are absolutely coterminous, right? Like, that is civilization means to have cities, right? And so there's no question that I'm not saying that cities are somehow unique to Western Europe. That's not the case, right? The question is... Or modernity. Right. Um, absolutely. Right. So um, the way... Um, how to put this best? Um, I'm, I'm trying to save as much time. Just the simplest way to answer your question is... Um, I would argue is the in in the later Middle Ages the collapse of serfdom in the countryside, which means not only do you have uh, a cityed civilization in Europe, right, um, which does not differentiate it from other cityed civilizations across that kind of great arc of civilization right through to the from the Mediterranean the Pacific Ocean, right, but what you then will have is you have the end of feudal social relationships and the unfolding, essentially, of free labor slowly over time. What this means is, rather than cities being limited, cities and towns and greater civil society being a limited development, basically, which was always constrained by right these kind of wider pre these pre bourgeois relations. With the end of, of serfdom, the central institution of feudalism, uh, in Western Europe in the 14th and 15th centuries, you basically are going to get um, the continual development of cities and towns and this wider civil society, which even though I'm characterizing it as the unfolding of a burger, bourgeois life, a, a town life, of course envelops the countryside. I mean, the countryside becomes thoroughly commercialized and in... It becomes, you know, you know, the bourgeois, the the aristocrats of old regime France in the 18th century, or the uh, ruling class of uh, Great Britain in the 18th century, are thoroughly bourgeoisified land and elites, right? So, I basically I would say the 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 key development is the collapse of serfdom, mm -hmm. right? Um, now, so the problem I have with that is just a capitals? one factor explanation, is. And the reason why I'm emphasizing the contingency here is the collapse of serfdom, serfdom both allows, right, for the development of more towns and cities, the development of more trade and manufacturing, the development of a system based on free labor, the development of civil society, all of those things. But at the same time, it's the development of those things that is to some degree undermining serfdom, if that makes sense. So it's that they're interrelated with one. It's not one causes the other, right? A number of things come together. You get the 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 the, the de decline and deterioration of serfdom and feudalism in the 14th, 15th centuries. You get the Portuguese and Spanish discoveries that massively increases um, the global division of labor in the world market. It means these little urban nodal networks across Western Europe are not just producing for the localities or indeed one another, but now for the wider world. And in this way, you have to think that in 1550. These Western European towns and cities are not just not producing solely oriented towards their own localities and regions in wider Europe, but the world, right? Goods and services going by way of the Portuguese and Dutch East India Company to Asia, colonization of the New World, trade in West Africa, all of that. So I, I'm really saying you bring that all together, and it's not something internal to Europe. It's rather the position Western Europe occupies in this kind of whole, to use the Wallerstein term, world system. Right, mm -hmm. if, if that makes sense. Now, I don't think it was inevitable. I think certain things lock into place, and then you have the slow development of, of civil society, which is allowed because Western Europe is becoming the central kind of exchange center for glowing global market world division of labor that allows more, that, that, that helps to dissolve serfdom, 
but is also reinforced by the dissolution of serfdom and more free laborers able to come in, more merchants and manufacturers in towns and cities saying, I can circumvent this guild because I can employ these free laborers coming in, right? And so a further development of free labor over time um, that, 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 that gives Western Europe this character, right? It's, not, it's neither, I, I totally am opposed to both internalist and externalist expectations. Mm -hmm. Western Europe does not become the center of uh, bourgeois civilization by the 18th century because of either the exploitation of the, the rest of the world, you know, the plunder and slavery and everything, or either the other side because of an internal brilliant cultural development, right? They're, it's interrelated, it's position in, in the entire world. To connect to Richard's point about why the rent, or why this, what, what do I think about, why do so many kind of, uh, why in the period of rising bourgeois society in the 16th, 17th century, do you have this kind of concept of the ancient world? Well, let's be straightforward. The first flush of a kind of consciousness of a new dawn of, of something will, that will eventually be called civil society is the Renaissance, right? Which is just right, French for rebirth, right? And of course, that begs the question, rebirth of what? Rebirth of classical civilization, the ag agrarian civilization of Mediterranean antiquity, right? Uh, North Africa, the Levant, Southern Europe, right? And of course, that doesn't just happen in Italy. It happens in all the city-states, all the towns and cities of Western Europe. It happens in the Low Countries, the Hanseatic League. It happens in London throughout the 15th and 16th century. Now, of course, but why, why is it understood as a rebirth? I'm not denying that there are elements in classical antiquity of a bourgeois society in something like in ancient Athens, but it, it, it simply didn't unfold there. But nevertheless, think about it this way. You have had in Western Europe, right? Basically, Western Europe was not Western Europe. It was, Europe was not Europe. It was Latin Christendom. That's what it understood itself to be. It actually understood itself to be Christendom. We call it Latin Christendom because there's a, obviously a place centered in Constantinople that understands itself to be Christendom, right? Orthodox Christendom. It understands itself to be Christendom, right? That's how it understands itself. The church is the center of intellectual and cultural life. Because of all these developments of the 14th, 15th, 16th century, collapse of serfdom, discoveries, world market, global division of labor, free labor moving into towns and cities, progressive development of towns and cities, development of civil society, of that kind of bourgeois society. Because of these developments, right, you have the constitution of a reading public, of people actually interacting and exchanging in towns and cities of Western Europe and having a social experience of a kind of freedom. Right. And now in this context, intellectual and cultural life slips beyond the control of the clergy, slips beyond the control of those people who have always had a monopoly on ideas, on writing the church. Right. And it's in that context, which essentially people begin to have a collective conversation about what's happening to them, what's going on. And the way that collective conversation takes place is the recovery of classical texts of Greek and Roman antiquity. But it's not a recovery. It's not like they accidentally discover a bunch of stuff. It's always been there. It's the church that has preserved all these things. But these pre-Christian pagan texts are imbued with a new meaning because the world, that, that more commercial and urban world of classical Mediterranean antiquity appears to them much closer to their own life than the world of the medieval church. Okay, but but I still would say what there what's if you forgive me for this for a moment, what's really going on is the kind of civil society developing and becoming aware of itself. That's what the Renaissance really is. The first flush of that, which is understood as the renewal of a classical antiquity. So if that makes provoked, sense. Was Savonarola a bourgeois revolutionary? <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to bring it up. Um, so there's a if you look at Italian. <laughs> If you look at Italian Renaissance, uh, Machiavelli, I forget the letter. There's this famous letter where he talks about, you know, I'm a far when he's in exile from Florence. I'm a farmer during the day, uh, but at night I put on my fine, I bathe myself and I put on my finest robes and I read the classics. And he says, we, we can only hope one day, we're in this whatever iron age, we can only hope to return to this golden age one day. So there's a concept that the best that could happen is a return to that. But what you also begin to see creep in, and this is with, um, what's his face, the the guy who writes the family book, like the Guide to Family Life in Renaissance Florence. I'm sorry, the name is escaping me. I apologize. I can't remember who. Like a Guide to Family Life. Oh, I can't believe I'm forgetting this. I'm sorry, but anyway, what this... No, that's the book of the courtier. Yeah. No, it's the family life. Um, it's a guide to 
it's basically a merchant who he runs a wealthy mercantile family and he's talking about you know basically how so you he, present yourself it's like franklin's autobiography almost about so how he, you'd be a good bourgeois what so he, no, 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 it's... That's not family. I'm sorry, sorry I don't know why. I'll, I'll look okay, up Okay, whatever, afterwards. anyway, the go on. The point is, he points that... He talks about how actually, through human labor, we're creating things that the ancients could have never imagined. So the Renaissance is Janus-faced. It looks backward and forward. In some sense, it thinks the best that can happen is a return of that pre-Christian, pre-medieval world. But in another sense, it thinks that we're building a new world, right? That human labor, particularly through human social interaction not through individual labor, but through social labor, the way human beings collectively through interacting with each other can transform nature and the world around them much greater than they can as individuals. That that is building something that is greater than the, the sum that is greater than its individual parts, right? Something that's greater than the sum of its parts, right? That world of social labor that the Renaissance is beginning to recognize. And they say, well, there are the... There are these giants of antiquity, but we can, he says, there are these giants of antiquity, but through our own activity, we can climb up on them, get on their shoulders and see farther than they ever could, right? Which I think is an awareness that they're returning to antiquity, but going beyond it, if that, if that makes sense. Yeah. Same thing on the shoulders of giants. Right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. here I have, a, I have a question, because yeah. I think, I mean, I, I really like this idea of the civil society, yeah. but I think it's misleading, right? Because yeah. it sounds like sort of these like culturalist arguments that are floating around right now. Yeah. That's all about bourgeois virtues and all this kind of stuff. But I think you made very clear when you said, you know, free laborers at this sort of that that is sort of the the hard core of it that makes yes. it possible. Right? And all these other things are expressions. Because I think all over the world, you know, or, or especially all over Eurasia in the large countries, you have these middling strata of people who are relatively free. You know, like who are merchants and or tax collectors and so on, and they all have families and they have discourses on their own, whether mm -hmm. through poetry in the Middle East or through sort of Confucian classics and uh, poetry in China and all that kind of stuff. And they also have a self consciousness, right? They believe in morality or in the good life and all these kind of things. But I think I think what you say, this idea that we're creating something new, you know, it's possible to create something new. That is that is sort of peculiar to Europe. But it seems to me very much connected to connected to the well the actual physical newness that's going on in terms of building and you know creating new things with these new fuels of capital and cathedrals going up and also canals being built ships being built all this kind yeah. of stuff. So in that sense, it, it it civil society goes back to this material core of free labor on the one hand and the the, the maritime floating capital on the other hand. Well, yeah, so civil society is yeah. fundamentally constituted by labor yeah. oh. become a, a commodity. I mean, that is free labor, right? That 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 is the basis for yeah. for, for, for uh, give me no, an example. There have always been merchants, if you, right? If you have that missing, right? Yeah. If you don't have the free labor, but you still have a class of people, let's say Confucian bureaucrats, yeah. who spend all their lives reading the classics and only a third of them get employed in the state, and the other two thirds they do nothing. Yeah, you know they live of their their cousins, you know, like income, and they write poetry, you know, and they become unhappy. They go to the mountains and they have critical discourses. They say, oh, this, the state's corrupt. You know, it should be more moral, or this is what one should do in life. So they have an ideological discourse of their own that's not owned by the state directly. <laughs> Okay, you, but but so in that sense, they are also civil society, but not in your sense. Well, that raises a question. I mean, is this yeah. was this process only happening in Europe, or is there a kind of global and I modernity? use the word Europe loosely? It's only happening in sections. No, no, Europe. no. I understand, yeah. but yeah. you're talking about Western Europe. But but was there perhaps like a global process? For example, it would seem to me that the world of uh, 18th century Qing Dynasty China or Tokugawa. Japan was very different from that of 500 or 1,000 years earlier. So in other words, is this process of global trade, is it creating a kind of process of global um, bourgeoisification? Are there, like, through this, are other societies other than Europe, were they also transforming in some bourgeois way through a kind of modernity? Or was modernity something that first started in Europe and then essentially spread to the rest of the planet. Let me give an example. There have always been merchants. But, no, but, well, but sorry, that's not, not what always. I'm talking okay. That's not uh, what I'm, I'm not talking but, about pre -modernity. No, I know, but Richard, I'm, I'm going to get to it. I'm, I'm get asking get how one pre, understands Pre-agricultural pre societies may not have been merchants. Okay, but there have always been since 
the rise of agriculture, settled agriculture merchants. I'm not saying that bourgeois society is just more merchants, but what what well, is more merchants? But it's a quality that it, it's a quantitative increase that is is a mu much more bound up with qualitative change. What I mean by that is this: um, merchants in traditional agrarian civilizations always have a role, right? Usually, typically, whether you're looking at China, or you're looking at Mughal India, Safavid Persia, medieval Europe, what they're usually doing is involved in some kind of long distance trade. Right, where they're acquiring goods at low cost and selling mm. them for high profits in, in regions where they're unavailable. And they're usually kind of middlemen for elites, right? Of moving goods for elites, etc. Okay. We have to say, why are there merchants in 17th and 18th century Western Europe doing these things like creating new colonial plantation settlements, demanding free trade, demanding that the political order, the aristocrats get out of their regulation, and demanding that they not tax them in a way that is excessive. Why are these kind of new demands being met? That's all deeply bound up with free labor. That is the degree that society across its length and breadth has basically been transformed by the commodity form of, 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 of labor, right? That is, uh, just give you, just let me go to a specific example. You get these entrepreneurial Atlantic merchants. Why? Because they want to set up a tobacco plantation no, they're, they, they could, they, merchants usually just want to do what's always been done to sell. But they want to do this because there's this growing consumptive market. Tobacco is hugely prized mm -hmm. by everybody in 17th century and 18th century Western Europe, from the lowest scale to the top, right? If you were to pluck somebody out of Western Europe in, let's say, 1720, right, pluck a plebeian laborer, you would see someone who, although totally poor in the context of their society, would have a bit of cutlery, a bit of textiles with some cotton and silk mixed into it, a bit of um, porcelain, tobacco, refined sugar, things that are dependent on this entire global process. Now that person, that plebeian laborer, couldn't be like that if it wasn't the world market and the global division of labor. But also you couldn't have that global market world division of labor if you didn't have that deepening of consumption that comes with the rise and development of free labor where increasingly all people are, depend, are, are dependent on going to the market Right to purchase what they need, right, but, to but, offer some labor or good in exchange for the products of other people's labor. But, but the question, James, that yeah. is in that same period, not yeah. talking about merchants in yeah. the Assyrian Empire, right. but talking about in the 17th and 18th centuries, in this period of the classic bourgeois revolution, yeah. you have this network of trade that encompasses the whole world, certainly including the civilized polities. So there's this trade. So the question is, how... Is this affecting, is there a process of a parallel modernity in places like China and India and Eastern Europe? Or are these places that essentially reacted to the modernity of Western Europe in a passive context? Right? How, how do they play? Because there is now a whole historiography that seeks to emphasize the specific modernities of the non-European in this period of classic modernity. Now, none of those places had bourgeois revolutions, mm -hmm. right? But, but mm -hmm. I think here, the sort of the Wallersteinian idea is, is really important, right? And it's, it's just a reworking of this old trope of combined and uneven development. So all these markets are connected, but they're unevenly connected. They play uneven roles. So Poland, for example, right? Like, specializes in their period as an agrarian supplier, for the northwestern, you know, the, the uh, for northwest Europe. So, and they, they, in, a, in some sense, they refutalize. You know, they reintroduce all the these, second like, surface. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The yeah. Second they, they reintroduce all these like harsh measures, and they have like this rickety like construction of the the, the noble republic. You know, mm -hmm. just to to administer that, and so they have a modernity. They import like the things of the Enlightenment, sciences. You know, they have universities on those side, but they it's specific to their needs of the country. You know, and to the needs of the the ruling class and the, the sort of the lower nobility, you know. So uh, I think that explains quite well how they can be different modernities. They're not, they're not completely disconnected from each other at all. They're part of the, the same process, but the process produces these that unevenness and the differentiation. Right, but I guess what I was thinking of is that that Alternative model modernity, that right? model applies yeah. to Poland, which again is part of this European system and culture. But for example. China in the 18th century was a society that was expanding, that was 
colonizing Central Asia. So it didn't seem to be a society that was either passive or in crisis. It enters crisis in the 19th century, and that's why the classic Enlightenment view of Chinese civilization is very positive, and then it becomes steadily lower in the 19th century. So what I'm wondering is sort of like how you see the specific, again, you have a kind of economic network that links the entire planet, but then you have a set of ideas that seem very specifically located, the, these ideas in this politics of bourgeois revolution in the Atlantic world. But Richard, that the, the two are not separate, meaning it becomes the, you, it becomes possible for those ideas. You understand the those historiography ideas that I'm flower, pushing yes, back on. Those ideas flower and congeal in Europe, but it's not because of Europeanness. They flower <laughs> and congeal of Europe because of the role specific areas of Western Europe occupy in this developing uh, 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 world market and global division of labor. Right. But so your, once your those ideas germinate, once because those that's... ideas germinate, it doesn't require that the rest of the world undergo some stage like transformations that Western Europe has. Those ideas become available. Critical uh, uh, collective and individual self-consciousness becomes available. People can reflect upon individually and collectively their society, how they're constituted by their social relations, how they might act to reconstitute their social relations of whatever form and to improve and better their existence. Once that takes off, it's a product of all of world history and available to all of world right, history, but, and it subsequently changes the trajectory of the whole planet. Okay, okay but we agree on that. But the, but the, again, the so one, it's, I think it's a fool's errand to get involved in. Uh, is this Europe or not? I just no, no, no. I, it's not I, a question yeah. about is it Europe or not because. Because again, the question is how one understands modernity, right? And so one, one traditional version, which is in fact the one Marxism has adopted, is that modernity takes off in one sort of particular part of the world. And through this being becoming the economic center of the world, it also becomes in a sense the political node from which these ideas emanate, right? In yeah. other words, it's the crisis at the core right? Mm -hmm. Which is the opposite of third worldism. Mm -hmm. It's the crisis at the core of the world system, right? Increasingly, I think there's been a, a kind of historiography which has sort of tried to de-Eurocentrize modernity. And I'm not like saying that I support this historiography. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying that this is a historiography that one needs to confront and say that modernity was some kind of global process and that this European modernity which is associated with these specific trajectories of, let's say, the bourgeois revolution and the enlightenment in this kind of social critical narrative was a specific one, right? And again, this goes back to the question of like, how much of this modernity was necessary? Because to a large extent, the traditional Marxist narrative is teleological, right? It's sort of, this, is a, this was a kind of necessary process, isn't it? The, the Europe on the other side of the rise of bourgeois play, society to play is as here. different. I don't necessarily believe the, the, the Europe I'm on the other side of the development of bourgeois society, okay, is as different from Europe before bourgeois society as Europe is with any other part of the world. Meaning, meaning the Europe that exists, the Western, but that's Europe creating of the 18th that's, century is 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 is. is totally different from the western europe of the 14th century but was the western example. europe of it, how how much of the how much of a parallel was there between what was happening in europe in the 18th century and what was happening in other parts of eurasia listen for various contingent reasons okay um human social relationships took a new form at a particular time and place roughly sections of europe on the western half of at the farthest western tip of the eurasian landmass between the 15th and 18th century, that could not have happened without a global development. Meaning if Europe just existed by itself and everything else was in water, who knows what course history would have took. It could not have happened without a global development. But that doesn't mean that it happened everywhere evenly with that global development. It means that Europe, because of its relationship to the rest of the world and the rest of the world's relationship to it, bourgeois society emerged there at that particular time and place, but it totally transformed the human raw material that was there and would go on to transform the human raw material across the whole world, right? Now that does, because bourgeois society develops uh, most thoroughly in Western Europe first, that does mean that the, mm. 
agents, the, sorry, the, 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 the means by which a lot of the rest of the world is transformed is through European trade, investment, imperialism, conquest. I wouldn't deny that. But the question has to be what's driving this unprecedented expansionism of Europe since the 16th century, right? And is, is it really um, Europe or is it, the, is it bourgeois society and then eventually it's crisis capitalism in the 19th century, right? That, that, that's what I'm trying to get at, right? But yeah, there was a transformation of human social relations in a particular time and place. But once that happens, the whole trajectory of world history changes, right? And, and to get stuck in, is this European or not? Or is, you know, I, of course, Europe is at the core of this. That's just the way history unfolded. But I, I, I'm neither trying to defend some old scholarship of the West and the brilliance of the West or to, you know, criticize, to develop some, you know, the newer emphasis on, you know, anti-Eurocentrism. I just think that whole thing needs to be avoided, no, right? I, I Social relations transformed there, okay? And they transformed, and, and that society is the origins of everybody today. And it's not essentially European. It's as African as it is European, and as Asian as it is European, and as indigenous American as it is European. It's a trans, it's, hum, it's just, you know, human beings are just, you know, little biological <laughs> globs that have social relations. And social relations transform there to radically change the way people interact with the natural world around them, right? Through the total transformation of social labor and the way they interact with each other. And they're becoming conscious of the fact that they're constituted by the way they interact with each other and their social labor. And thus able to reflect on and change the way they interact with each other and their social labor, <clears throat> i.e. the Enlightenment, right? Is a kind of dawn of a new kind of human consciousness that is not essentially European in any way, shape, and form. Although it's some people on the far western end of the Eurasian landmass that first experienced this and, and this consciousness, right? So I fully agree, but I yeah. think this, this just makes the case for reading the Enlightenment backward from the present. I, I, I think which is what we need to do. I, I'm, I'm for that, not against that. What, what I mean by that is sort of not go the traditional route which is also has its merits, right? Mm -hmm. But not reading just the historical antecedents, this long history from the 12th century, 13th century, until we arrive at the 18th century and the great revolutions and all that. But reading it from the global context backwards. So um, how come that we have an uneven but connected modernity in all, all over the world right now, whether it's in South America, in China, in Africa, in, in Europe, right? And that is, that is certainly the case. How come we have that? So... Um, then go back and look at this moment, you know, where capitalism rises, all these ideas rise, but also how from the beginning they were connected in these different forms of colonialism. And why is that important? I, I think it's important to keep legitimating, you know, this political project of uh, not only the bourgeois revolutions, but like all the good things that the Enlightenment has. So it, it's important to show that and, the f well, not, not just the good and the bads, but sort of you know the how it's how it's like interwoven with um, colonial history, world history from the beginning, and how there's no getting rid of it. Sorry, I'm, I'm not garbled. No, yeah. I hope not. I mean, yeah. for for me, at one point in time, Richard, you answers. I'm, I'm talking about what said last thing, Inter and I know we're way past time, right? So, Please. international socialism. The goal would have been in the 19th century, capturing Western Europe. Today, the goal of international socialism, of course, has to be capturing South Korea, China, Japan, Canada, the United States, in addition to Western Europe, the old kind of homeland, of, you know, central nodal point of global capitalism, etc. But, but for the population of humanity, right? Capturing not them because of some cultural specificity, but capturing the forces of production and the, the, the potential for transformation of the human condition that lies within those core regions of North America, Western Europe, East Asia, right? If that makes sense, right? And, and so to my mind, that's why when we go back, I, of course I'm being as anachronistic as everybody I'm criticizing. I'm looking from the vantage point of my present. I can't not be. But that's why I think what we have to emphasize here is um, this broader... I want you broader... to look at everything from the vantage point of the year 2100. <laughs> um, so, so, Tell so, us how it turns does out. Does that make sense? That, 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 that's why it's worth this kind of the, you know that 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 of course the probably capturing western europe in 1900 
you know, that would have been key. Today, obviously, it's a much wider place of, of the advanced industrial cores of production, right? Talking about 2100, yeah. um, I mean, capitalism is a moving target, right? And there's also the debate whether, like, how the expansion works and how it's necessary for capitalism to expand. So, like, what other parts of the world are there that are ready to be, you know, transformed through capitalism? Then there's Africa, obviously, right now. North Korea. Yeah. Uh, North Korea, yeah. Yeah. No, the, the dream of now, the but no, they are yes, capitalists no. already. They don't. Yeah, but but sort of in terms of the I don't know upgrading of like uh, North Korea, you know, all this kind of stuff. But Africa is. Yeah. By the way, can I say something that's horribly oh, crude? But I think like my my brain is fine, so I'll go to. Yeah. Um, did anybody see the um, you know when there was the the Kim Jong Un Trump summit North Korea, mm -hmm. um, the this sort of the video. Yeah. That, that Trump showed him. I mean, basically, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it was, like, great. It was, it was amazing. amazing. The, but that that, that is the utopian goal of Western bourgeois America. society. That was an amazing video. <laughs> but that's <laughs> but that's bourgeois like radicalism. Trump's perfect was yeah. perfect for it too, because he's like selling real estate to North Korea. He's like, I'm going to make you guys the nicest hotels. <laughs> oh yeah. no, yeah. I mean, no, but but tr the uh, Trump or Trump Tower or Trump Tower Pyongyang or, or sorry Trump Tower. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So the point I'm trying to say is that the bourgeois radicalism, the integration of North Korea into peace, prosperity, progress, right? Uh, now, apparently, the, the neighborhood in Pyongyang where the North Korean elite live is called Manhattan. That's the nickname. <laughs> oh, yeah. really? But that makes so much sense. Also. But it's the point is, that, but but that is still um, it's ideological, but it is a a, a bourgeois revolutionary consciousness, right? Um, the, I was talking about the expression and the, the, vi or the propaganda Korea. video for why North Korea should. I don't mean propaganda in the bad sense. I mean it in just the neutral, descriptive sense um, of why North Korea should denuclearize and enter the you know international community, etc., on different terms, right? You know that that. And and yet paradoxically, I'm just like like free association. Yeah. But paradoxically, it's sort of on the one hand, it's true, right? Capitalism is still expanding and it's still like. like tearing down all the walls with like cheap merchandise and like, propaganda and all this kind of stuff. On the other hand, this link between the bourgeois revolution, the political revolution, and bourgeois free, you know, constitutions and rights and all that, that's weakening. Right? So we, we sort of understand if North Korea opens to the capitalist market, it's not going to be a free republic. Neither is China. Neither is lots of other parts of the world. Oh, no, I'm, I, that, no, I'm, no, I'm saying Trump's like, vision so is... What's, uh, yeah. No, 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 regardless yeah. of Trump and North Korea, yeah. like what's happening to this link that liberal theorists and, and lots of people had for a long time that you know opening the market means introducing bourgeois democracy? What ha so that's not actually happening. Okay, well, I'm capitalism. Yeah, so, but you can be capitalist now. Without no, but I'm saying capitalism has... But capitalism is the crisis of bourgeois society, right? That the capitalism is basically th this is not an argument for a need to, you know, somehow return to what the bourgeois revolutionaries did. Right. This is just a discussion of what the bourgeois revolution sort of means in the present, not an argument for the bourgeois revolution is a model for socialist revolution. That's I, I didn't mean to suggest any of that. Right. Um Rather, it's trying to argue about, you know, trying to just discuss and work out what classical Marxism and kind of, you know, further defining this category of bourgeois revolution, what they were trying to capture, right? If that, if that makes sense. So, right. So, yeah. to, I mean, on that note, like, what do you make of the sort of, I guess, rejection of, like, you know, people like... July Fourth is not my holiday. This is like the holiday of the oppressors. This, right? Like rejecting, yeah. Like the the DSA, uh, like is not going to celebrate July Fourth. I mean, maybe they do. Maybe some of them will. But like, just like, cer or certainly like the anti-Trump. They'll work on the Fourth of July just to protest. State senatorial candidate. Oh, Ocasio-Cortez. So, no, Salazar. Salazar. Yeah. Yeah. Congressional candidate. Right. Which I think... Um, but so the I statement of the barbecue was, this is not my holiday or something like this. No? I oh, I don't know. Think okay, so. I mean, it seems... I don't know how you can reconcile that attitude with an electoral strategy. Because, in fact, one of the things mm -hmm. that I, I noted about Ocasio-Cortez's campaign is how, like, and part of her, like, campaign video material was, like... 
saluting the veterans. Okay. So I think DSA, uh, okay. I don't know, you know about the whole panoply of the DSA, but at least there seems to be a move towards embracing Americanism, for better or worse. So, I mean, really, Ocasio Cortez is. I mean, DSA. It's just a. It's a label. It's like these people are liberal Democrats. It's, it's just like. It's, a <laughs> it's no. It's like people. Ten years ago, they said people. A lot of friends of DSA who would not like that. I know, but but it's <laughs> like this. it's like ten years ago, people yeah. called themselves for five years ten progressives. Yeah. 40 or 50 years ago, they just would have called themselves... It's like, you know, mm -hmm. you have, like, Negro, Black, African-American, but it's like you're supposed to use a certain term or a certain term, but it doesn't really change, like, some fundamental reality. It's just, like, a different term. I mean, it's interesting well, it's that... something a little more fundamental, right? Not at the level of policies. I mean, I mean not, not like a shift, actually, to socialism, but, but something... I don't think it does. I mean, like in Western Europe, like people who call themselves socialists have been part of mainstream politics and still are. It doesn't mean anything. So it's interesting. But that's like saying, you know, now Americans play soccer. OK, that's a cultural shift, but it doesn't really mean much in terms of society. Well, don't you think it would mean something? It might have implications for how America positions itself in the world. Like if it No, means, because they'll never qualify. Directly, but, so... I mean, let's talk about soccer. Yeah, <laughs> so what I was talking about. <laughs> so, so. I mean, it's like, socialism. yeah, socialist. It's like so, you have like a socialist caucus, and you know, in instead of I don't know, I mean, what's what's the difference? Okay, I think it's the same with as with the Greens in Germany, right? So when it comes down to, they're not changing the political economy. They are sort of. A reform faction within the bourgeoisie, but it's a necessary reform. It's a, it's sort of like a reform that makes sense. So I think all the socialists in America right now, or almost all, are really social democrats, and they they don't really know what social democrats mean, so they call themselves socialists. So, but they're for classical social democratic reforms, and they can't even imagine a revolution beyond that, which is sort of quite realistic because. That's not on the agenda right now so much. Okay, but, but the same kind of things that, that people in DSA, whether you call themselves social democrat or democratic socialist, they're the same kind of thing that people who just call themselves liberal would have been advocating 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, so it's a different term, but I don't think it really makes a difference politically. I mean, maybe like... It could have long-term implications, I think, if, if socialism is not so demonized as it has been just because I mean how do you think I mean don't you think like the ideological force of capitalism has been has been central to its uh, reproducing itself and perpetuating itself like in America that may be true but like take look at a country like France or 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 Germany right yeah. you have like the socialist party or the Social Democrats, right. those are not demonized. It's like being a Democrat. Right, but right, do, it doesn't matter. We're closer to like socialism, a future socialism, than we are here, or or no? Would you, would you say? I mean, the argument the would be that you're closer to like a, a a welfare state, but I think yeah. that that like the trajectory, you know, maybe you have more of a welfare state left in Europe, although it's being dismantled. But I don't think that the term per se. I mean, the term means something. And it does mean something, right? So I think that if people are willing to say, yeah, I'm a socialist, maybe they'll start asking themselves, well, what does socialism mean? And maybe that'll make them more interested in Marxism. I don't think right. that someone like Ocasio-Cortez or, or Cynthia Nixon saying, I'm a democratic socialist, means much more than comparable politicians in Western Europe. I, I mean, regardless of them, I think social social democratic reforms have a meaningful impact, like a, a, a substantial, non-trivial impact on people's lives, but also on sort of the big shape of things. You know, not only on the capacity of the working class to just you know fight more because they have more time and you know more security and all that, but also they 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 really do change the political economy in a small way, in the sense that there is like it introduces this element of negotiation into who gets what, like what sector of society gets what. Right? Well, Social democracy, if they're strong enough, like in Germany, they have big unions, you know, they can say, 
we are for this or against this. We want this part of the pie. And mm -hmm. it's still a capitalist game, right? And mm -hmm. it's, they still suffer from all the, 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 the problems of the capitalist crisis, like outsourcing, cap competition. They have to do this. But they have sort of an accepted political role in negotiating. Okay, but the, qu the two questions aren't, aren't opposed to reform. It's a question of the consciousness of which mm -hmm. they're pursued with. And the que and the question is also like whether you can actually win those, win right. those welfare state reforms. So or if like, they're won, will they is, remain? Or, or, right. Yeah, exactly. Do we see yeah. progress in history in the last fifty years or eighty right. years? Because are it's these, like are they movement toward reforms, making it so that like the working class or civil society or whatever, however, like is more capable of. Negotiating right. These kinds of reforms since the seventies, since right. the seventies, yeah. everywhere the, the welfare question, state yeah. has yeah. basically been in retreat. The social democratic yeah. welfare state, and yeah. the other problem you mentioned, like you're you were talking about Europe, and is that the social democratic welfare state program really only works at best in these advanced capitalist countries? It doesn't. Like in that sense, it's not a global program. Oh, I agree. I, I completely agree. And it's 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 it, it's based on the expectation of the third world. You know, I wouldn't. No, I don't think uh, that's. Yeah. I in part disagree. At least, in part at least. I disagree with that yeah. statement that it's based on the exploitation of the third world. But I think it doesn't work in as yeah. a program in poor third world countries. That's why, like, there you had the different types of revolution. I mean the. But but also like in those countries where it supposedly worked, it's been in retreat and is even continues to be in retreat. It's been in retreat, but it's still <clears throat> a sizable position. I think it's easy to underestimate that. But if you look at someone like Merkel, right, who is technically a center right Democrat, but he's to the left of Bernie Sanders in many positions, and they're they're consensus in Germany, and she can't go behind them, and she doesn't want to because she's on board with them. She's a, Totally reasonable that people like kids have you know free childcare and all this kind of stuff, you know. So, so, and the reason why that can't be demolished so easily, even though there has been this pu this pushback, is just because the working class in Germany is well organized. It's not, it's not, not sure. radical. Can, they're can, not revolutionary. They're can totally, I ask you a question yeah. about that? Um, what would you say? Um, keeping in mind this kind of global interconnected perspective, yeah. what would you say to a kind of Trumpian perspective that said, well, that's all well and good about Germany, but it's conditional on the U.S. taxpayer overburden on its military protection and on a huge trade deficit. I mean, what would you say? To, I'm just curious, what would be your it's, response to I that? Mean, there's, I mean, it's partly true. You know, what Trump says is, is overblown and nonsense and yeah. all that. But there's always this positionality between the different countries. And it's uneven. So Germany sort of sucks some, you know, money, resources, labor from the rest of the European Union. You know, and gives something back, but not, not everything that it takes. Yeah. And uh, the European Union in general has these, like, colonial relations with Africa through France and other places. And there's, like, these weird rivalries between the U.S. and Germany and the U.S. and the European Union. Know, and with China and all that. So that's the capitalist game. You know, I think that's the global imperialist game. So that, that's far from you know, fair, equi equitable, equal relations and all that. But, but the Ger what I'm trying to get, the West German welfare state yeah. was not built uh, on uh, a, 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 a socialist party connected to an international no, no. socialist movement winning reforms. It was built on massive subvention of the U.S. Cold War state. It's 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 first it's an inheritor of the Bismarck model, yeah. right, which is a conservative model of pacifying the working class. Yeah, and then it's really that again in the Cold War competition with I agree. Germany, right? So they were competing like who can pay the workers more. And the West Germans could pay the workers more and like so give them more goods and stuff like that. And it worked. You know, the East Germans saw that and they said, we want that too. And they, they walked in mass over. So in that sense, it really, really worked. But that bribe, if you want, you know, has a life of its own. And it can't be taken away so easily. Even though the Germans, I think, realized that in, the, in global competition, it's very costly to have that. You know, the, the German, what was the Wait, German capitalists? Like, or what? Like there'll be a revolution in Germany? No, but it's... It's not... It, I mean, can't it just it, be taken away if it's well, not available it elsewhere? Well, it can't, because it's a democracy, right? It's a bourgeois democracy. And so, on the one hand, the state is, you know, in the sort of bourgeoisie, but it's it's like a machine, you know? And you, it doesn't work that way. You can't just, like, walk over everyone. It's not a dictatorship. And I, I, I think in the U.S. it's also not a dictatorship, but it's just that, you know, power is much more on the side of big capital. 
and the leaders get bashed all the time. But still, in the United States, there are some things you can't take away quite yet. So I think right now, and I'm reading this because I have a green card, you know, mm -hmm. right now they're deporting people with green cards. You know, if you're Mexican, if you came from Mexico or from Middle East and Central America, you have a DWI or something, they deport you. It's beyond that. Have you heard yeah. about the... The Naturalization Task Force. Yeah, right. Yes. Right. And it's all, it all specific. So in other countries, when that wouldn't fly. And I think that, I, I have hope that doesn't fly in the U.S. You know, there's still enough resistance from civil society. You know, from everybody who, who feels they have a stake in that. That's what I hope. So some things go and some things don't go. Uh, Gabe, on your question on the July 4th thing, or maybe yeah. coming up closer to Saturday, July 14th, if sure. there are people who don't want to celebrate July 14th also. I mean, abolitionists in the 19th century, socialists in the 19th, early 20th century always celebrated these kinds of holidays. Like mm -hmm. people like Frederick Douglass, Eugene Debs would celebrate things like July 4th, Bastille Day, etc., or take note of them. I mean, to the degree to which now they're opposed, though, it's not... Um, I don't think Bastille Day, by the way, is opposed. Well, let me say one thing. What I mean to say is the degree to which something like July 4th is poo-pooed or something. Um, and the Declaration of Independence specifically as, is like cast away as like a document of slaveholders. Yeah. Um, and of course, people say, oh, well, this is because these, you know, you know, the, the, these ideals were always a lie. These were always wrong. Jefferson's a slave owner. Um, exactly. One of my favorite scenes is in the um, Richard Linklater movie, Days of the Confused. There, it's yeah. the last day of school set in Texas in 1976. So the bicentennial yeah. of the uh, Declaration of Independence. And there's, there, you know, it's June, so there are about some, you know, July 4th coming up. So the teacher says, she signals her kind of new left bona fides. She says, um, uh, oh, and remember, she talked about the Chicago Convention in 68. Yeah, it's like, don't, no, she says, don't forget the re what, like, when they're pushing all this, like, bicentennial crap down your throat. It's like, remember, what you're celebrating is that a bunch of rich guys didn't want to pay their taxes. Yeah, <laughs> arist <laughs> aristocratic said. white men yeah. didn't want, white, right. sl aristocratic white slave owners didn't want to pay their taxes. Yeah. Um, that's because of the failure of socialism, right? That if socialism, in other words, um, in other words, I mean, we could say, oh, those people are idiots, all idiots, but because of the failure of socialism uh, in that context, right, there has, the, the left <clears throat> has taken this trajectory, which it's ultimately achieved, where it's something like July 4th, instead of being celebrated as a kind of moment in a progressive development of, Although, so, of, an, of, of, a, of a greater degree of social emancipation, rather, you know, the whole thing can be recast as, you know, it's turtles all the way down. It's, well, it's, it's, late, it's oppression as, all the way down, Shaheen. But up, you know up what through I mean? the like 60s. That's, that's what it becomes in the context of the failure of socialism. So what I'm trying to say is we can make fun of people like that, the Chicago New Left school teacher in, in Days and Confused. But the Chicago early New but Left. It's the ultimately early, the failure of socialism. But the early right? and middle New Left still, like, embraced the American Revolution and... Uh, you know, so the, oh and, no, the and, early new left. No, he's right. It's, absolutely. In the, but, but in the but that's a, but that movie A is set in seventy six. B is written in ninety. But what you see the new left moved into, and it happens in the history. They all become academics, and they start writing the new history of the American Revolution, in the nineteen seventies and early eighties. And it's all exactly this was always the, the assertion of an. Yeah, exactly. Eventually a becomes. Kind of revolution, yeah, sort of. Yeah, like it's, they're called the neo progressives, and they basically argue it's all. So, you know, it's all just an assertion of slave planters or patriarchal interests, expropriation Native Americans. But that's their disillusionment, right? In their heydays of we are going to change the world, they could imagine themselves as building a more emancipated world on the top of giants, i.e. the American Revolution. But then in the 70s and 80s, in their defeat and disillusionment, the whole thing has just been oppression, exploitation all the way down. But right. I think it's, I mean, I think it's not so bad because I think these are sort of like short-term tactical maneuvers, right? I don't think that's going to stay. I think the, the value of these holidays, it's contested all the time. Yeah. And uh, I think it's, it's, it's these are po polemical contestations that like sharpen debate. It's like William Lloyd Garrison saying, you know, the United States Constitution is a compact with hell and a covenant with death or something. Wait, see, I disagree because I think which that Douglas no rejected by the way. consideration. Yeah. It's just like a loss of memory. There's instead it's like just like a rejection of revolution completely. Like there's like oh well the, the, there was no revolution. It's rejection of the ideals of the Enlightenment. Whereas like the, you know for all of like social like all uh, through King, but also like going back there's like 
and Douglas too, like recognize, recognizes these documents and these resolutions as like something that we need to build upon. The fact that like that's no longer that's completely lost. I think that's more. I think that's more of a profound thing. I don't think it's a tactical, momentary thing. I think it's something that's been been the case with the new left for a, a few decades. Mm. And then, and then there's a, the separate kind of brings us to this question of well, okay, well, like, where does that, what is to be done about that? Like, where does that leave us politically? Well, it's a teachable moment, right? As they say. I mean, this was I was also getting back to the one of the things that strikes me is the the curious reversal of Jefferson and Hamilton in terms of their right. evaluation. So it used to be that Jefferson was the hero of the left and Hamilton was seen as the defender of the capitalist big capital. oligarch. He big was capital. big capital, finance, right. banks. He was like, <laughs> right? So that was the old vision. And now it's like Jefferson is the evil slaveholder. And, and Hamilton's and, Caribbean and he raps. Yeah, And he Hamilton exactly. is Caribbean and he raps. Sco a ba ba bastard son of a Scottish peddler. Is the right. Fun. And yeah. it's like, it's, like if you think about that from an early 20th century perspective that seems like this or up until like through the 60s right you would have had the old narrative of like jefferson good hamilton bad and now it's totally flipped and again like i was talking about like with james about like how like even though in their moment they're counterposed, Jefferson and Hamilton are actually fairly similar figures in a certain sense but that that's exactly richard thank you because i think that's a great way <clears throat> to kind of bring it all back together I really listen. I'm, of course, I think Jefferson is a, in terms of the self consciousness, is a more important historical figure than ultimately Hamilton. Although Hamilton's extremely important because of what Jefferson writes and does and all of these things. Um, but I would still say the that first like thing one has bill. to do before one begins debating Jefferson. Jefferson only and, the two dollar bill. I'm very sympathetic to both Hamilton of them. More important. Let me just finish this. I think the first step one has to do though is essential is defend their or, or recover their shared horizon. Right, their shared historical horizon of the bourgeois revolution. Hamilton and Je the opposition in the 19th century U.S. between Hamiltonianism and Jeffersonianism is uh, an opposition within a bourgeois radicalism, that they were both American revolutionaries and bourgeois radicals. Their ultimate goal was to further development of a, of a self-development. Their ultimate goals were to, cr to destroy the political order of the British Empire, build a new re constitutional Republican political order that was l um, meant to defend the achievement of civil society up to that point and allow for its further development across the continent. And their subsequent falling out with one another is actually a debate within that kind of modern liberty, that bourgeois radicalism, about the means best to achieve their shared end.